Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Atlas Demo Day 2022. My name is Inza Valenciaga, and I will be steering this event on behalf of ETEDO Space of Innovation and the EU-funded Atlas project. The reason we invited you to the Atlas uh, Demo Day the second time is because we want to update you with the latest Atlas Interoperability Networks developments and, of course, showcase you or demonstrate you the business opportunities you will have by joining our network. We'll also uh, use this time to uh, showcase the newest services that have been developed by our new Open Call winners and, of course, uh, demonstrate how this also benefits all of you. <clears throat> to this end, we have prepared an agenda full of uh, innovative digital data-driven use cases provided <coughs> sorry, by the Innovation Hubs and the Atlas Open Call winners 2021, who have implemented 11 new technical solutions to address predefined um, five agricultural challenges. <clears throat> As you can see in the agenda, and you will be able to see it in the chat, the link, we'll have five joint sessions clustered per challenge and comprised by the Atlas Innovation Hubs and Open Call Winners 2021, who will be introduced by our project coordinator. We'll interact with you via polls, and we will also use question and, <coughs> and answer sessions, and we will conclude the event with a panel discussion concerning digital agriculture and food systems and their important role to reach the net zero goals. <clears throat> Before we go into the content and our speakers' presentations, I would like to quickly share with you a key um, housekeeping rule, and that is <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the chat function. You can find this option on the very right corner of the DLG platform, um, and we will use this our, as our main interaction way to interact with you. You can here post any questions, any comments, any concerns you may have regarding the presentations, the panel discussions, or even for troubleshooting. We will do our best to get back to you by today, but please bear with us. If we don't manage today, we'll get back to you after the event. Now, without further ado, let's start with our very first speaker, and that is the keynote speaker, Dionis Foster, Director General for Sustainable Agriculture Initiative Platform and former raw material sourcing lead at Nestlé. Dionis, the screen is yours. Hello and good day to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this event, to the Atlas Demo Day 2022. And uh, it's also a pleasure for me to uh, come forward with a few introductory remarks from a side platform uh, perspective. Good, <clears throat> let me start. So. Yes, um, a few words about our organization. Um, Sci Platform is uh, a membership organization. It's a food and beverage membership organization that um, has uh, the vision to develop a sustainable, thriving, resilient um, agriculture sector and that protects the Earth's resources and the human rights and animal welfare. Our purpose is to harness the collaborative power of our members to accelerate widespread adoption of sustainable agriculture practices and the transformation uh, to sustainable food systems. Um, a few of our values, just that you have an idea of who we are. We work in a pre-competitive setting, so from a food and beverage industry point of view, it's a pre-competitive setting. We have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge building. We develop together um, sector-wide uh, industry solutions. And uh, we have uh, uh, also a lot of networking. So networking is key for us uh, in our organization. We overall, in the last recent years and up today, we have more than 160 members. Uh, members mainly come from the food and beverage industry, is from the processing, but it's also from uh, the input industry. So input industry members, uh, such as buyers, Genta, Yara, etc., they are our affiliate members, but they're also participating in the development of our solutions. Over the recent years, we have been seeing our members to make a lot of pledges, pledges towards net zero, towards science-based targets. And uh, we are hearing a lot of regenerative agriculture, that regenerative agriculture is a solution uh, for to achieve net zero or the science-based targets. And uh, we have been asked 
from our members to embrace these uh, new topics, these new areas, these new themes, and to develop solutions uh, for the industry. We have a number of frameworks as an organization. We work on sustainable agriculture. It's something that we did already for quite a couple of years. Um, it's uh, building on our 11 principles and practices. Uh, we call that FSA. More recently, now beginning this year, we started to work on regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture uh, has to be defined. Uh, a framework needs to be built. It's mainly focusing on climate, biodiversity, soil and water from our point of view. And then the latest uh, initiative that we have, it's climate smart agriculture, which is mainly looking at the climate resilience, the GHG reduction and the removal. All these schemes, if we look at them into a supply, in a supply chain, in a value chain approach, uh, they are addressing uh, basically data collection at the farm level. But we have also solutions and a solution in place that addresses data collection in the value chain from processes to manufacturer. And all this data, all these solutions require data. And this data is obviously, at the moment, it's still collected manually. It's collected through questionnaires. But in future, this data should actually be collected automatically, collected through um, smart devices, so through smart tools. So data interoperability, possibility of aggregating data, it's absolutely key. So this is something that we look forward in future that we can that we can build on tools, on solutions that come directly from the industry, from uh, that we can aggregate this this uh, the data from these tools, um, and in order to inform then the mad processes and the manufacturers. So in very short and in conclusion, um, we have never seen as much interest from the food and beverage side um, in climate smart and regenerative agriculture. We as a platform, we are working on regenerative agriculture. We work on the framework. Equally, we work on climate smart agriculture. Um, but if we don't get data from, let's say, from smart tools, um, be it at the farm level, be it in the supply chain, we won't be able to bring the necessary evidence to the manufacturer and the retailers, uh, and we will not be in a position to inform the consumer about all the good work that is done in the upstream uh, in agriculture. And with this, I thank you for the attention and I give back to the studio. Great, thank you very much, Dionis. That was a very wonderful um, presentation and, and also very important for, for opening the second ATAS demo day. I think the audience can already sense um, how important is a tool like uh, the Atlas Interoperability Network uh, for both our societies and our markets and also to lead the way towards sustainable agricultural practices as well as combat monopolism as well as data dependency. But in order to emphasize this a bit more, I would like now to welcome our project coordinator, Dr. Stefan Rilling, who will present in detail the Atlas Interoperability Network, um, how the interoperability mechanism works, and how this will also create business opportunities for participants like you. <clears throat> this presentation will basically persuade all of you why you should become part of our game-changing network. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, Insa. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to... Uh, the uh, actually already second Atlas Demo Day event. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you our, our project, which is actually running already since October 2019, uh, Agriculture Interoperability and Analysis System. Um, thank you also very much for this uh, uh, re really uh, nice and interesting uh, keynote introduction. Um, so I think that talk clearly, clearly shows how important uh, uh, interoperability and the ability to connect to different data sources is for uh, uh, the digitalization of uh, modern agriculture. And this is in the end exactly what we want to achieve with this project. Um, just a, a quick introduction to the consortium. 
Um, uh, it's a quite large project with uh, uh, around 30 partners from seven different European countries. And uh, in the end, we uh, have uh, within the consortium uh, a significant part of the agricultural value chain and uh, agricultural research um, included. So wh why are we doing this? I, I think uh, this is something I do not have to explain to you. Uh, farming is a complex business. Um, just one example for, for, of an average farm. Uh, it is already quite quite digitized, uh, especially the, the, the larger farms we, we, we see today with uh, several hundred uh, of uh, hectares um, in size. One farm, seven different software systems uh, in use. So farmers use uh, 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 already a lot of software. Um, and also the, the market is quite large when it comes to digital uh, products uh, related to farming. So, and uh, usually there is uh, always a, a good reason to use a specific software system for a farmer or to use a combination of different uh, specific software systems. But um, the pain starts when it comes to exchange data between these uh, different software systems. And this is in the end uh, the essence of what, what Atlas is uh, trying to achieve, um, uh, namely uh, simplifying the exchange of data between different digital solutions in uh, agriculture. Uh, sorry for that. And what we are uh, uh, or what we have been developing in the last three years is what we call the Atlas Interoperability Network, and does that does exactly uh, what it uh, says. It's a network of uh, uh, different digital solutions, uh, which then become interoperable. And uh, uh, it is uh, three main pillars which uh, enable that interoperability network. Um, so the, the, the first basic principle is that the data exchange uh, in, in Atlas is achieved through standardized services. So it's a, a service-oriented architecture. Also, a, a central aspect of Atlas is that it is a, a decentralized network of such services or of such uh, digital systems. So that means Atlas is, is no, no platform, no central data hub where all the data is uh, uh, stored flowing through or where services are hosted. It is completely decentralized. Um, uh, we need a minimum of centralized components, but I will come to this on the next slides. And uh, all participants in the network are trusted and autonomous. Uh, it means uh, they have to be legal entities. Uh, in the end, these are companies providing software solutions. And autonomous means these companies are completely uh, responsible on their own for providing uh, services, for consuming services, and for managing uh, their, uh, their users. Uh, to make that a little bit more clear, uh, uh, I've created this visualization. So in the end, the Atlas ecosystem consists of two parts. The, the Atlas infrastructure, which uh, runs, uh, as I said, a minimum amount of centralized components, which are used to uh, um, build up the infrastructure needed to interconnect different software systems. And the other part of that ecosystem is uh, uh, run by the, the Atlas participants. So as I said, Atlas participants are, uh, yeah, in the end, companies providing digital solutions, and that could be either a, a service provider and or a service consumer. Um, service provider and service consumer uh, do not necessarily be the same uh, company or the same the same participants. They can be very different, and they all have their their specific end user base. So Atlas is, is not dealing uh, directly with the end users, in the end with farmers or, or actors in, in the agricultural value chain. Um, Atlas is, is in the end dealing with the providers of digital solutions. And how that interconnection of different software system works is uh, shown on this slide. Um, uh, what you see here are in the end, two, two uh, software systems, an FMIS and 
for example, a, a system which uh, does uh, deals with fertilization. We have uh, such partners in the consortium. Um, and uh, you can imagine these, these two uh, providers of systems are different companies. Um, uh, and uh, we have an end user, a farmer, who owns uh, accounts on, on both of these systems. And what Atlas in the end enables is the connection uh, between these two user accounts um, and the ability to exchange data between these two systems on behalf of the end user. Um, the technology behind that or the protocol behind that is OAuth 2. Um, I won't go into the details here, but what is important to understand is we have uh, one end user wanting to interconnect two different systems. So the end user needs a, a user account on both of these systems. And uh, with the infrastructure provided by Atlas, uh, a coupling of these two accounts is possible. Um, as I said, Atlas uh, makes use of standardized services in order to make all that work. And uh, we call these standards in Atlas service templates. So service templates are uh, models of elemental agricultural processes. And uh, these processes are modeled by, uh, uh, in the end, services providing an API, um, which enables exchange of data. Service templates are vendor and technology agnostic and uh, contain in the end the formal specifications of a service. So we have the, uh, uh, a common API description. We use a open API for that in, in, uh, in the case of uh, um, web-based uh, REST services. And uh, it also includes a human readable specification document. Um, the service templates are and have been developed by uh, the consortium members and other stakeholders. So it's a collaborative effort to, to uh, develop these. And all of the, the uh, available service templates are, uh, can be found on our public GitHub repository. The link will uh, appear on the last si slide of uh, this presentation. Um, uh, the service templates which have been developed within the last uh, three years come from uh, uh, four fields uh, of agriculture. We have uh, the field of sensor and, and uh, machinery. We have the field of, of arable farming, uh, field management. We have uh, livestock farming and we have uh, irrigation management. Um, and uh, below here, you just see a, a list of, of uh, names of these uh, service templates. As I said, all, all uh, that can be found on the GitHub uh, repository. Um, uh, the other uh, main asset we have uh, been developing in the last years is the Atlas participant portal. This is in the end the, the, the user interface for Atlas participants. It means uh, if, if uh, you as a company want to uh, provide an Atlas service or consume Atlas services, and you want to be uh, part of the of the Atlas interoperability network, you have to register uh, through the Atlas participant portal, and then you can do uh, the registering and the management of of your services, management of your of your uh, participant data, and you can uh, uh, also uh, do a validation of your services. The URL uh, to that can be seen on the left. Um, as Atlas is a so-called large-scale pilot in, in terms of, of the uh, uh, EU uh, project language, uh, we have been uh, uh, establishing a, a, a set of uh, what we call innovation hubs. So these are, we have more demonstration sites, but these are the, the main uh, demonstration sites. These are, these are uh, in the end farms or, or research research uh, um, operations uh, where we establish a sustainable ecosystem based on innovative data-driven services. That means um, we have a, a demonstration site where you can, can uh, test your, your services, your solutions developed, where you can demonstrate the technology, um, where we can have uh, events uh, uh, with a relevant audience to, to demonstrate 
technology we have been developing. And as these uh, sites are also equipped with sensor equipment and uh, where, where experts are available, these can also be uh, used to validate uh, existing techno or new technology, to validate your, your solutions against uh, uh, um, a well-established and proven sensor network, which uh, serves as the crown proof um, data. Uh, our our uh, innovation hubs will be introduced in the course of this event. Uh, what we also did in Atlas is to establish such, such a, a ecosystem of uh, services and participants. Uh, we have been uh, given our part of our funding through open calls to attract innovative uh, companies providing digital solutions in, in uh, agriculture. Uh, our open call winners will introduce themselves today and, and show what they have been done uh, or what they have been doing with this farming. Um, you see the logos of the participants in the middle. Um, we have been uh, um, set multiple topics for uh, these open calls. We have the topic of asset tracking, fleet management. We have the topic farm to fork. We have the topic of irrigation and we have the topic of wheat and pest control. And, and all the open call winners presenting today uh, have been developing uh, solutions uh, amongst these four topics. So uh, what we are developing in Atlas gives you uh, uh, several opportunities to uh, foster your digital solution and to, to uh, uh, enable uh, new business uh, opportunities. So Atlas enables the interconnection of existing systems and that means you can, in, in the end, easily extend your existing solution uh, with Atlas capabilities. Okay? You can just do a retrofitting of what is already there and, and what has been uh, proven on the market uh, in the end for, for a longer period of time. So there is uh, no need for, for companies wanting to be part of Atlas to uh, start completely from scratch. Atlas is also an innovation. Catalyst, um, uh, because with the Atlas technology, you can focus uh, completely on your unique selling point. Uh, as as uh, the software in Atlas is interoperable, there is no need, for example, for an, uh, a company providing an innovative solution in, in satellite data analysis to build a full-fledged uh, farm management uh, system around that solution because uh, the, the, the core part of the application can be uh, paired with an already existing FMIS. So you can uh, really focus on, on what you are doing and what you are best in. Atlas also acts flexibility for farmers because it avoids uh, the vendor login and allows uh, the farmer to, choice, uh, to choose which uh, solution fits best to the, to the specific farm. So uh, there is no need to, to use some black box solution, which uh, solutions which promise we, we do all in one and just use this and, and you are, you are uh, uh, fine. So you are really flexible in the choice of your digital systems. And uh, with the combination of uh, such different systems, really, really complex operation flows, uh, working process on the farm and data flows can be, can be uh, modeled uh, uh, within the digital world. So to conclude, Atlas is a decentralized service-oriented uh, system. Um, it interconnects or it can interconnect agricultural machines, sensors and data services, and it is meant uh, to uh, improve the digitalization of farming operations. So Atlas simplifies communications, uh, Atlas simplifies the connection to the consumer and uh, Atlas uh, avoids, uh, for example, multiple data collection processes, thus uh, um, making uh, the, the whole uh, uh, administrative work, the work uh, uh, which comes with uh, enabling digital solutions much more simpler and easier. And uh, the, the uh, important aspect here, the data sovereignty is always at the farmer. So Atlas uh, enables in the end new business models for and with the farmer. And uh, 
now I've come to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward of, uh, to the rest of this event. Thank you. Great. Many thanks, Stefan, for your presentation. And I think um, we can stick to this last sentence that you just stated in your uh, concluding slide, uh, new business uh, models or opportunities for and with the farmer. Uh, and as we said, I mean, we're, our target audience is still, of course, the, the farmer, uh, but we are also looking beyond this uh, for software developers and the like to register as a participant to the Atlas Network. Um, I recall that the presentation was uh, uh, very compelling and uh, for, by now you should be all uh, thinking of registering as a participant and this is why we will now offer you the link to, to join directly to, to the Atlas Network uh, as a participant. Now, if you have any questions to Stefan, any comments, suggestions, anything that you would like to, to raise, uh, please write them down in the chat and we will get back to you. Um, again, if we don't manage to, to get back to you today, uh, please bear with us. Uh, we'll get back to you uh, at a later stage, uh, either today or after the event. So now you should all be able to know what ATLAS uh, is about. And of course, you should also understand uh, how the interoperability mechanism <clears throat> will work. Um, so we now want to get to know you better. And this is what we have um, created a poll question to, to know who, who you are, who you are representing. Uh, and you will also already see this uh, hashtag uh, in the chat. So you will just simply need to copy paste this uh, hashtag and uh, put it as a URL and then just copy this and then you will be able to see the question. Um, this year we are not going to be reporting the answers through me. Uh, we will rather just use the chat and you will be able to see the responses uh, as soon as we go uh, receiving them. Um, yeah, this is uh, how we will uh, report the results to, um, this year. In the meantime, we will now jump into the next part of our event, we, which, which will be composed by joint presentations of the Atlas Innovation Hubs and the Open Call winners. The first speaker will be Basilis Piscinaras from Soil and Water Resources Institute, HAO, who will represent the Innovation Hub in Greece and who is paired with the Open Call winners, Camille Casemaker from Terranis and Federico Longombardi from Primo Principio, France and Italy, respectively. They will be presenting their winning solutions to tackle challenges related to irrigation management. Therefore, I will pass now the screen over to you, Vasilis. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to introduce you to the Atlas Innovation Hub established in Greece. Our hub hosts five extensively instrumented and over 2,100 non instrumented pilot and demo fields at the, to which the Atlas irrigation services are developed. Uh, Atlas offers a unique opportunity and the ideal ecosystem to materialize advanced ideas on robust digital services for the farmer. Uh, and in our case, this was made possible through the concerted action of the Ulich Research Center the National Observatory of Athens, the Soil and Water Resources Institute, and our farming partners, of course, in close collaboration with the Atlas Platform Architecture Team. So we developed a series of services, including soil moisture analysis, satellite temperature analysis, irrigation data analysis, and water availability based on high frequency data monitoring and processing. Uh, we acknowledge the multitude of technological breakthrough solutions offered, either ground-based instrumented monitoring or satellite data driven, and uh, we are making use of them. There are numerous challenges identified and met, such as monitoring and um, equipment durability testing and reliability of course big data management interconnection of various uh, technologies and communication protocols extensive testing of developed algorithms for integrity and accuracy 
uh, addressing large and small scale farms with or without access to instrumentation with regards to the developed service quality and uh, adapting services to a robust and comprehensive, inviting but safe, interoperable and expandable environment. Uh, through these services, farmers can look back in time and study the evolution of critical meteorological variables such as rainfall and air temperature. Likewise, they can look ahead to the forecast of these variables. Uh, they can study also the soil moisture profile of their fields and assess their irrigation practice performance through the, through the analysis of soil moisture content. They can be advised on the optimal irrigation dose to be applied when they want or can irrigate. Via the monitoring of the cumulative parameter of growing degree days, farmer can improve the irrigation practice to comply with the phenological stage of the crop. Uh, our tools are based on Atlas service template, of course, ensuring a welcoming interoperable ecosystem for any provider or consumer wishing to join the platform. You can visit and get the feeling of the services in the pilots of our hub, as many stakeholders have already done. Uh, our hub is a living lab of high added value, as proudly presented in the following video. So I hope you enjoy this video and this presentation. It's now time to introduce you to Teramis, one of our open call winners. So Camille, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, hello everyone. And thank you for the presentation, Vasily. It was uh, very interesting. So let me share my screen. So um, hello, my name is Camille, uh, and I'm going to present you uh, our Wago service. Um, so I'm working for Tyrannis, an SMB founded in 2014 and based in south of France. We are currently around 20 employees who are developing and commercializing services based on satellite imagery for uh, agriculture, viticulture, and environment sectors. Um, and for this project, we were a little core team of three members, uh, Clément Murg, the project manager, Quentin Froment, the IT engineer, and myself, the project engineer. So uh, the, the Atlas Interoperability Network is a very good opportunity for Terranis to test the interoperability of uh, WAGO and to connect it to other data and service providers. Then it is also a great opportunity for Tyrannis to reach new potential users on a European scale, as we have mostly clients in, uh, in France. 
and of course to provide a reliable solution to farmers to face the current uh, challenges around uh, irrigation management and optimization. So WAGO is a, a support uh, tool dedicated to farmers, uh, which provides a daily recommendation of irrigation uh, when the field is under water stressed. So to compute this, uh, we, have a, we have a model developed by the CESBIO, a French laboratory, uh, which uh, use uh, the weather data, agronomic data, soil data, but also satellite imagery with Sentinel-2 images. Uh, and all of these are computing a water balance model and pr uh, provide a recommendation. So for example, the recommendation of today would be if the field is under stressed, um, you have to irrigate 40 millimeters uh, of water. So now I'm going to present you a little video of the Pixagri platform uh, where you can find the WAGO in it. So when you connect to the platform and after the creation of your field, you have access to the general view which sums up the current state of the field. On the left is the last satellite image acquired to identify heterogeneity inside the crop coverage. Then, if the crop is under water stress, a recommendation of irrigation is provided and is accessible here. Then you can go in more details by clicking on the irrigation tab and have access to water balance graph. The first one represents the lack of water in the soil, so the water depletion. And when the water depletion is going under a defined threshold, the plant is stressed and the graph becomes red. The second graph is the evolution of evapotranspiration since the sowing date. It is very important to indicate all irrigation doses by clicking on this button. You only have to select the date and write the amount to update the water balance. So to sum up, WAGO is a strong and reliable tool to optimize irrigation enhanced by the precision of satellite images. Yeah, so um, WAGO is uh, responding to the actual context, context of climate change, where the water is a resource to preserve, and especially, of course, in the agricultural sector. So WAGO provides a reliable irrigation tool to farmers that can prevent from underwatering or overwatering and then saving time, money, and also energy. Uh, so to conclude, uh, as I said before, WAGO prevents from overwatering and underwatering. And uh, for farmers, it represents a save up to one water application per person. And in France, uh, it's from 15 to 70 euros per hectare. Uh, WAGO allows also the farmer to keep record of the weather and irrigation practices and to progressively improve and optimize its practices. And of course, to share and communicate the irrigation practices. So thank you. And uh, now I will let uh, Federico from Primo Principio uh, speak and present uh, his tool. Good morning. And uh, today I'm going to present you uh, our solution about irrigation management. Uh, this is our team. We worked together more than 10 years and uh, our Y4 Agri irrigation solution is based, is the result of a strong collaboration between software developers, telecommunication engineer, web developers, and of course, farmers and uh, agronomists. We also have in our team some experts about uh, irrigation and uh, IoT solution and also, also artificial intelligence. Uh, well, why we decided to join uh, the Atlas solution? Um, in, our, in, in our SME, we are a cooperative company. We are fan of open solution, open software solution, and we believe that the future of, agri of agriculture rely in the strong connection between market, farmers, and service provider. Uh, so actually we want to interconnect our wi agri solution with third-party data provider and services and we uh, honestly think that atlas goes in this direction that's why we decided to join the atlas project of course this is also an opportunity for us to expand and to gain more visibility in our in uh, the european market but let's go straight in our solution which is called wi agri ear 
uh, Wi-Fi Rugby here is a combination of three main sub-models uh, working about uh, the water management. The first sub-model is able to perform a, a daily uh, real-time water balance. So we are able to provide uh, to the farmer if, uh, when and where is needed, uh, the irrigation is needed. Then we have also another model about uh, hydric stress early warning. So uh, we are able for a single specific crop to understand if the crop is slowing down um, because of hydric stress. So we can advise uh, um, the, the farmer about uh, how much water is needed um, on, on his field. And then we are, able, we, we are also able to provide uh, a simulation planning. Imagine, for example, that uh, um, the farmer want to extend the field or also want to change um, the type of crop. We are able to uh, simulate in advance the water irrigation planning that uh, the farm uh, would need in the next year. Um, in the end, our value proposition, so the value proposition of our Y for Agri E solution is completed uh, by a last function, which is pest monitoring, because we are able to combine the irrigation water balance uh, with a pest monitoring risk, which are connected with uh, uh, bad irrigation that you can perform in your field. Um, one of the distinctive uh, aspects of our solution is the opportunity to tune and to perform a fine tuning of the water balance model depending on the crop and also on the soil that you have in your field. So as you can see on the right part of the slides, we use uh, a special software which is running in a cloud with artificial intelligence. Uh, hour by, by hour and day by day, we receive a real feedback from the field, for example, from the farmer, but also from special sensor. And this data coming from the field are able to tune the software model so that you can achieve um, a very high accuracy of the water balance simulation. Um, now I would like to share uh, a real service with you. So this that you are uh, looking now is a, a real simulation software from uh, uh, a vineyard in the Prosecco area. We are in Italy in uh, one of the most famous production area about uh, uh, a wine which is exported all over the world. Uh, I will show you how all these complex mathematical models can be uh, translated in a really uh, user-friendly graphical user interface. Um, so looking at this red line, this is um, a modelization of the amount of water which the specific soil of our farmer is able to preserve inside. So this is a kind of a, a model of the soil of the farmer. Now, when the, um, the production season is started, of course, the specific plant, uh, depending on specific condition, is start to consuming this kind of water. And you can read the water consumption on this uh, green line. So when the water uh, consumption is reaching uh, the level of the water, which is in the field, you start to have a kind of hydric stress. So when the um, green line is surpassing the red one, you need an irrigation. And if you want, the software is also able uh, to give you uh, information about how much water and when and where you should irrigate. If we go down, I have, sorry, I have to go uh, fast because my time is not so much. Uh, you can see all the irrigation performed by the farmers. So with this uh, DSS, with this software, with this turnkey solution, we can also measure how much water the user really used in a specific field. And we can also monitoring, we can also monitor the uh, real hydric stress. When this red, red line, which is the, uh, maximum evapotranspiration, so the optimum plant functionality is different from the blue histogram, which is the effective evapotranspiration. It means that our crop is slowing down because uh, maybe the crop needs water or because we performed an over irrigation. I, back, I go back to my presentation and um, we can say that the challenges of our turnkey solution is to trigger and face the following problems. First of all, the waste, the, the waste of water resources. Uh, we also try to fight against pathologies which, has, which are connected with uh, irrigation, with bad irrigation. We can also help farmers to contrast weeds and also to improve the yields because if you perform optimal irrigation, you can work on quality and quantity of your yields. Of course, we also support soil erosion contrast and we also support the lack of documentation because with this turnkey solution, you can have year by year the exact documentation of your irrigation plan. Benefits. 
uh, first of all, um, uh, avoiding over irrigation and under irrigation. So we produce daily water need for a specific crop. Uh, early warning uh, about uh, um, a non optimal condition in the field. Annual water planning, if you are planning, for example, to change the size of uh, your crop field, or if you are planning maybe to change your crop. And uh, of course, uh, a DSS, a unique DSS, uh, which help you to avoid irrigation, which can perform bad results about pests. Uh, these are the real results that we have tried to measure in our experimental field, I was, I was telling you before, in Prosecco area, so in Italy. Uh, so we were able to measure in the last uh, production season, so in 2022, uh, minus 20% of hydric stress, of course, an increase of the top quality grapes, um, uh, trip and labor saving, because you don't need to move every day in the field in order to check your uh, uh, hydric condition, uh, improved uh, control. This is a, a very important feedback coming uh, uh, from the customer. And uh, this year, which was very, very positive about uh, the pest control, we have been able to reach minus 30% of uh, the use of pesticides in the field. Uh, that's all for my side. That's all that I wanted to share with you today. And uh, back to the studio. Very good, Federico, all Camille and Basilius. Thank you very much for your great presentations. And again, as a reminder, these will be available, fully available, these interoperable solutions through the Atlas network. So again, you will need to register, you will need to join as a participant uh, to be able to use these services. Now, um, we'll start with our very first question and answer session. And this is why we will ask you all again to use the chat to pose your questions to our speakers, to the first cluster. Um, and while you are doing this, I will need to go through the registration form. We have received a question, a very interesting question for Vasilios. And I would like to um, pose this question to you. Uh, so I think it's going to be very valuable for everyone to hear. And then I'll go reading out loud on your questions. So, um, Vasilis, the question is to you. Now, we'll start with our very first question and answer session. And this is why we have all gathered here, the, th the first three speakers. Um, while you start writing all your questions in the chat, we have received a very important question through the registration form that I would like to read out loud because it's beneficial for everyone to know. And then I'll go reading all your questions as they come through. All right, Vasilis, um, this question was for you. It says, do I need to offer a full scale solution or a suite of solutions to join Atlas as a service provider? Yes. Uh, so uh, this is one of the advantages of the Atlas that you can offer, let's say, individual services and not uh, a, a, a very large suite or, or, or a full-scale solution. Everything is uh, adaptable in Atlas. So you can offer what you have from an individual, let's say, single irrigation service with full suite of services that could include also other cultivation activities such as fertilization, crop protection maybe and other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Vasilis. I think this was quite clear for everyone. And now I see many questions coming through, so I will start reading the very first one. Um, Federico, this one is for you. It says, how does it work and how did you develop the irrigation decision support system model in order to achieve these results presented in your use case? Uh, to develop uh, the old solution, the DS test that I presented before, you need several years of work. So we started with a team of agronomists studying uh, the last research study and papers uh, uh, carried out in US uh, and in Europe uh, in the last 10, 15 years. Then we developed our own model, putting together pieces coming from other models and from the um, literature. And so we develop an original DSS mathematical solution, but then we have to test the model. So we call uh, several customers, several producers, and we perform the, the so-called comparative study. So uh, we compare on the film, uh, on the field, the standard irrigation strategy performed by a farmer with the new irrigation strategy performed following other models. And tuning these mathematical parameters year by year, we were, we were able to reach the solution that I presented before. So actually it's quite long job uh, running in the last five years. Mm -hmm. All right, that was very clear. Thank you very much, Federico. Um, Camille, we have another one for you. Um, it says, what is the place of the satellite imaginary in your model? 
What would you say to that? Uh, yeah, the, so the satellite imagery is first uh, used to monitor the de development of the vegetation through the, the crop cycle, but also to estimate the crop coefficient uh, in the water balance model. So it's not used, uh, it is not used to directly uh, estimate the water deficit in the soil, but to estimate the crop coefficient, which is uh, a little part of the water balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, uh, I just uh, want to add something. Uh, it is also to be to to see what is going uh, on the field, uh, what is the current stage of the field, and to have a, a more reliable results. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, a bit related, but yeah, somehow related to what you were explaining. It also asks uh, for you, how was the model tested as such? So yeah, so uh, as I said during the presentation, the, the model has been developed by a, a French laboratory in France. And so uh, they worked uh, on the model for 10 years, so five years of development and five years of testing. And they tested the model in uh, countries such as uh, so France, uh, Spain, Maroc, and Morocco, and Portugal. And uh, they have also tested the model on seasonal crops, uh, such as maize, uh, wheat, um, cotton, tomatoes, potatoes, uh, by measuring uh, with the flux tower, some evapotranspiration measures, etc. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful, thank you. Sorry, okay. Thank you, Camille. Um, all right, I think I'm seeing the time, so I will try to also go through the other questions. Federico, this one is for you. Um, it, it asks, what does a farmer need to activate your decision support system with or agree IRR, whether stations, special sensors, and how long does it take to activate the services? Okay, the perfect answer is to activate the service. You don't need something special, you just need a standard weather station. Actually, the minimum uh, data which has required in input uh, are rain, uh, temperature of the hair, and uh, humidity of the hair. Of course, if you have more complex system and more complex uh, sensor arrays, for example, if you have soil moisture sensor, if you have other sensor, the model can improve uh, its results and can be more and more precise. But in, but in order to activate the irrigation model, you just need a standard weather station, and it doesn't matter uh, which company and which brand uh, is the station, because our solution is open, and so it's compliant with uh, any kind of sensor. Uh, the time for activation is almost uh, real time. We just need a few hours in order to activate your account and uh, get the data coming from uh, the sensor to our DSS model. So it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Federico. And Vasilis, we have another one for you. Can your service be implemented in any field and in every crop? Will it work under every weather condition? Uh, yes, we believe that it can be implemented after the appropriate par parameterization of specific crops, let's say. It can be implemented in any field and every crop. And yes, we believe that uh, it can work under every weather condition that re require really since it has been tested in Mediterranean, the, the hot spot, let's say, of irrigation under different conditions. Yes, we trust in this that it it will work, um, mm -hmm. work for any field and every crop. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Vasilius. And now we move back to Camille. There is a question for you. How can we subscribe to the service? It says. Yeah, so uh, first you have to uh, create an account on the Pixagree platform uh, and then to contact uh, us, to contact the commercial uh, service of Terranis to, to give you access to, to the model and to the service. So it's very mm -hmm. simple. But in any case, this is a reminder for all participants, um, this will be available through Atlas. So you will need to register first through Atlas and then you will be able to receive this um via atlas all right let's um wrap up with this federico there is another question for you the graphical interface for the model via web browser looks very interesting is it possible to buy a turnkey service including a graphical interface 
for the final farmer? Does it also exist on a mobile app? Uh, yes, of course, the final farmer, depending on, on his technical approach and also on his competencies, can buy uh, uh, the, uh, only the numerical output of the DSS. In that case, uh, we, will, we will furnish only the mathematical output of the model. But we, of course, we also sell a turnkey solution where the final producer can have access uh, via web browser, but also via uh, mobile app to the graphical user interface that uh, I presented you before. So, of course, yeah, it's possible. So, uh, we open um, the possibility to buy uh, only the numerical output of the DSS or also the graphical user interface. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Federico and Camille, as well as Basilius. I think we can wrap up this first question and answer session. Um, I see many questions coming through, but again, we won't be able to answer all of them today. Uh, we'll try to do our best, but if we don't get back to you, then do not worry, we'll get back to you afterwards. Now, we'll move on to our second joint speakers, representing the Atlas Innovation Hub in Germany and the Open Call winners integrating solutions to face challenges related to the food and um, to the food value chain, which is also better known as the EU Green Deal calls it from farm to fork. Um, please welcome Florian Schiller from uh, International DLG Crop Production Center, Stefan Scherer from Geocledian, um, both coming from Germany, the first one an innovation hub and the second one an uh, open call winner, and Paul Delonge, Calabi, and Kuen Uitenhove, Haila, both coming also from Belgium and uh, open call winners 2021. Um, without further ado, I will give the floor or better share the screen to Florian. Over to you. Welcome to the International Crop Production Center. My name is Florian Schiller and I will give to an insight in the International Crop Production Center, which are acts of the Innovation Hub here in Germany. And, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, before I will get uh, to introduction, uh, <coughs> here you can see our entire team uh, at the International Crop Production Center, which I would like to introduce to you, which is uh, we are completing all projects in the agricultural uh, and yet yeah, uh, now I will give uh, some background information uh, at the International Crop Production Center. The International Crop Production Center was founded in 2010 uh, of October for crop production trials and the specific questions. It covers approximately 630 hectares and the main objective of the DLG International Crop Production Center is to, pr uh, to promote application-oriented uh, research and transfer to practical agriculture. These are intended to contribute uh, the solutions of future challenge. Uh, and one of the challenge uh, from us is, yeah, um, we are committed to progress in agriculture and that is uh, digitization in arable farming plays an important role here and the technology of the future, it is also dealt with by us. Uh, of the agriculture, and that uh, is why we are also part of the innovative uh, Atlas project to inform our 30,000 mem uh, members about the interoperability structure created by the project and uh, to support the project through our networks in the agricultural sector so that interoperability structure are transferred to agricultural uh, applications and uh, for this purpose we accompany uh, to use cases in the field of crop cultivation and uh, as an innovation hub uh, yeah and uh, through our trade uh, fair activities at the DLG we strive uh, to inform all instrument uh, um, stakeholders about the atlas project at the national and the international level uh, yeah. At the same time, we offer the basis for future use cases in the project with our uh, agricultural infrastructure uh, at the International Crop Production Center. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I will start my video. Yeah, I would like uh, now to take you in a short video uh, of the crop, uh, crop rotation trials. This video shown once of our rotation trials, which served as a basis for application-oriented solutions uh, for the creation uh, of an Atlas service of Geocladian. Geocladian is one of the open core, you know, and we develop as a basis for this. Uh, when this video was made, I give background information for this video. Uh, when this video was made, we were seeding web seed uh, for the harvest in 2023. Uh, as a farmers, we always say uh, that after the harvest is before the harvest. Uh, and yeah, before seeding was winter wheat, 
for the harvest uh, in 2022, which served as the data basis for remote sensing of land conditions uh, for Geocladian. Uh, the arable land at the International Crop Production Center is one of the most fertile uh, soils in Germany and is uh, characteristic with black soil. And this video shows uh, um, that we had very, very dry conditions again this year due to lack of rainfall in the summer months. We are located here in the rain shadow uh, of the Western Mountains called it Hart. This means that uh, in this growing regions, there is usually even less rainfall than uh, in other regions uh, here in this location there. And I give you short, uh, briefly uh, explain our crop protection trials. The trial plots are 80 meters wide and 60 meters long in size and are laid out four times in crop rape, uh, crops, rape, wheat, sugar beets, peas, and corn. This try addressed uh, the two specific questions uh, in which is the most economical and ecological uh, uh, crop rotation here for this area. Yeah, and for the open coal winner, uh, this trial serve, uh, this trial uh, serve as, a, uh, as a data uh, basis for the harvest maturity service. And in order for Geocladian, uh, to integrate the Atlas service, we provide weed quality data from different crops years in the trial plots. And yeah, one of the fundamental challenge in the agriculture is uh, to determination uh, of harvest maturity uh, in the crop. This is uh, uh, always dependent on external uh, influence at harvest time and has an impact on the farmer's harvest management. Uh, here you want to support agriculture with the uh, creation of new digital technology uh, and service in the project. Uh, yeah, I think the Geoclidia will provide uh, information about the exact Atlas service following. Finally, uh, here you can, key, uh, uh, can see a complete overview of our crop rotation trials. Okay, and yeah, my last slide, um, yeah, I will give some information uh, about uh, what we uh, deliver in the project. Yeah, um, we deliver uh, our platform uh, from exhibitions and demos to communication and field testing in the International Crop Production Center. And that is the providing of knowledge transfer uh, to agriculture. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, <coughs> uh, um, yeah. And, uh, Let's move on the open call winner in the farm to four category. And I will hand over to Stefan Scherer from Geocladian, who will give a detailed insight into the developed Atlas service, which was created through our database. Uh, my name is Stefan Scherer. I'm the CEO of Geocladian. Um, Geocladian is an agricultural data analytics company. Um, we are operating a crop monitoring platform, which is called Acknowledge. Um, based on this platform, we are developing custom crop monitoring solutions, like we present uh, today. Um, we have been founded in 2013, and we are currently six team members. So why, didn't, why did we join the Atlas Interoperability Network? As we are providing crop status information to the supply chain, to multiple users, like farmers, mills, or biogas plants, and also contractors, uh, we are providing this information on the farm to these supply chain users. And Atlas enabled us to provide that, or to exchange the information in a standardized way. Um, this is for us a big advantage, uh, this, um, since it simplifies the data exchange. The solution I would like to present today is uh, focusing on crop status monitoring and on harvest maturity information uh, for corn and wheat. So we are uh, calculating the biomass and biomass index and the dry matter content of these uh, crops. And it allows users to um, indicate when to harvest and to mo monitor also the progress of the harvest. So you can uh, schedule your harvest better and increase with that yields and quality. Introducing Geoclidian. We convert satellite data into meaningful information 
and simplify the use of images in your farm management system. Our images are based on the strongest satellite data available. They're provided at a very high resolution and cover any region in the world. True color and vitality images also help to check the crop's growth and overall health, while variation maps highlight a field's different growth regions. Our analytics tools allow you to see how the land is developing and to compare it with other fields. We provide an update on the field status about every two weeks or even less, so up to 50% more updates than other providers. You also enjoy images at attractive prices due to the free open nature of our satellite data. Allow our highly competent team with years of experience in agricultural monitoring to support your inspection of farmers' fields anytime, anywhere with geoclidion.com. So you got a jump start into the video, uh, which explained our platform. Um, and now I want to go move forward to uh, the next slide, where we explain the X challenges we want to address with these services. Currently, if you want to get uh, for the supply chain members to get information about field status, in particular about harvesting, maturity, harvest maturity, you need to do a lot of measurements in the field. So the farmers need to go there and measure um, dry matter content, protein contents in the laboratory, which is a costly, um, is costly to do. And now the service allows you to do that on uh, each and every field and much, much more easier to exchange this information. And um, yeah, it's, it saves you a lot of costs and allows you to increase the, the yields and the qualities. So, as I explained the benefits already, um, it's also transparent and it's unbiased. Imagine you're a contractor or you're a buyer of goods. You need, um, uh, you are, have 100 farmers under contract and you get now this information in a standardized way. And Atlas is for us now excellent since it allows uh, an easier sharing of the information between the farmers, uh, the co their, and contractors, food processors, or even consumers. We think that increasing the transparency is crucial um, to achieve more sustainable agriculture. It's, since uh, the information flow is uh, enabled and uh, we can also optimize uh, the use of inputs with that. Uh, thank you very much um, for uh, uh, allowing us to present here. And I would like now to hand over to Paul Delange from Calabi. So Calabi is a virtual short supply chain marketplace that is um, focused on um, empowering all stakeholders along the short su supply chain. The um, short, short supply chain is challenged with uh, a dozen of opportunities, and it is the mission of Calabi to uh, make the uh, short supply chain competitive with the, um, with the conventional, uh, more globally or oriented supply chain and uh, the, the means to do so is um, um, by empowering the stakeholders of the short supply chain with the same type of data-driven solutions that uh, conventionally only larger corporations um, benefit from currently. So what Calabi does in this effort is that it acts as a centralizing an agent on all the um, all the individual stakeholders of the supply chain um, um, this so that it can start centralizing and aggregating all the um, single data sources that span the, um, the short supply chain so we do this by providing a, a a um, virtual platform that the farmers connect to and they can start uploading and, and offering their um, products and then Calabi um, just these farmers with B2B um, stakeholders and um, at the same time it uses the data that then flows over the platform to start empowering both ends 
with, uh, with, with data-driven analytics. Now, Calabi puts farmers first, so we don't expect or we don't force the farmers into anything. We, we really empower them to use uh, our solutions at their uh, conditions. So the reason why we were so interested in joining the Atlas Interoperability Network is that basically interoperability is, is, is the key to Calabi's and the short supply chain's uh, success in its effort to be competitive with the, with the larger supply chain. So Atlas is a great um, playing ground first and then a great network for um, researching and then realizing such shared data in efforts where indeed uh, uh, the atlas community is of course characterized by its international and and and, and cross the sector span and that makes it actually a real great match for the type of solutions and the type of research that um, that we are doing so for for um for the solution to really work also it's actually the more um interoperable our solution works across different types of use cases the more valuable it becomes so that's why uh, the atlas community resonates so well with our uh, our services and also it's uh, definitely the 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 um, mission and, uh, and ambition for Calabi to not just operate in the region where it currently is working, which is Belgium or, or Flanders more specifically, but we are definitely eyeing to um, span out and, and, um, and, and be as cross-regional as the Atlas community is itself. Now, specifically for um, the, the Atlas uh, project, um, for the open call, we wanted to work out um, um, one specific example, one, one boxed example of such a data-driven analytics that, that, that empowers the short supply chain. And that is specifically a demand forecast. So currently indeed, uh, conventional supply chain uh, um, profits a lot from um, the, the demand forecast typically large wholesalers, very large international uh, um, stakeholders uh, use demand forecasts to really match their, uh, their uh, output to consumers' demand. And the short supply chain being uh, spanned up by smaller individual components doesn't conventionally benefit from such uh, uh, data uh, empowerments. So, that's why we wanted to bring this solution uh, via the Atlas community to the smaller independent stakeholders of the short supply chain. So we developed two services to that end. Uh, one is uh, an API that, that, that makes available uh, on a lower level basis uh, the, this, this raw demand forecast solution that, that basically any, um, well, engineer, if you will, could use to um, to empower uh, her her agricultural or, or retailers um, business. But also we wanted to expose visually that, that data. So for the Atlas members, we made available uh, um, a dashboard basically <clears throat> that graphically exposes uh, the hosted API. And like an insight has been saying, uh, I just reiterate that indeed um, um, the Atlas members that the different uh, accounts can then um, access our, our dashboard. So I'll just really briefly give a, a short show and tell of what the dashboard looks like, just treating one very specific example where um, where we are now envisioning ourselves as a um, agricultural agricultural stakeholder who wants to learn about uh, the demand forecast in a region of one specific popular crop, say tomatoes. So here she can start accessing our, our dashboard. And um, so, so we've pre-selected this specific crop tomatoes. And then within a time frame, we can learn about the regional uh, um, 
demand of this tomato crop. So this will be the demand forecast, say, in one example window of, say, the first week of, of August. And here we indeed see the demand where uh, we, for example, see this interesting effect where there are some weekend effects uh, where it, uh, it, it, it slows down later, um, probably because it's a Sunday, which is one important. So both temperature and holiday variables kick in. And here's a longer term, uh, longer term demand forecast um, uh, that now, for example, a farmer can use as typically a farmer has both a B2C and a B2B channel and just as one example of a use case now the farmer can use this demand forecast data to decide what um, what output of her tomato crop she will focus on uh, um, putting out to the b2b channel as indeed the Calabi demand forecast uh, solution that was developed for for atlas is b2b forecast it's it's based on the retail uh, demand the point of sale data so then she can start using that data to indeed focus uh, when demand picks up um, on, on b2b and then and then maybe you know put out less tomatoes in in her csa box that she that she would use in her uh, b2c but i'd be happy to um, detail more use cases uh, in the in the q a so also please at your own convenience you can um, go to more show and tell at atlasdemo.calabi.be. So now definitely there's multiple challenges. Um, I mean, there's um, many individual stakeholders with, with, with many uh, clustered uh, data pools and to be competitive with you know, global uh, um, supply chain that, is, that basically has one large single data pool. We have to learn how to aggregate and, and centralize this data to, to learn from it. So this is the challenge really that because of this lack of optimizations, still today many of the individual stakeholders are, are sort of reinventing the wheel and, and tend towards a, a sort of an individualistic approach where, where really the strength would be here in the in the large numbers. And this also, uh, for example, uh, yields some suboptimal scheduling and the distribution of, of crop. Um, and in, uh, um, in, a, in a true sort of dream scenario for the short supply chain, even there, uh, using this centralizing approach that Calabi wants to introduce to communities, um, now short supply chain stakeholders can start um, harmonizing their um, crop scheduling. So the benefits here are uh, that, that it, indeed for, for the farmers, this is a first step in optimizing not just their, their output, but also their um, crop scheduling. And for the retail partners, it's, it's proven that data-driven demand forecast yields um, uh, microscopic up to 15% of reduction in um, waste. So this would definitely be an approach to, to start attacking food waste. And uh, well, in general, this is uh, uh, indeed part of the cited effort of, of making short supply chain from farm to fork competitive with the current status quo. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions later in the Q&A. Um, um, and now, without further ado, I also want to um, introduce Kuhn from Heiler and um, learn about the solution that they've been. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Paul, for the presentation. So um, I would like to show you uh, the project or discuss the project on uh, hemp data share. So you're focusing on, I would say, uh, the hemp uh, crop. Um, first of all, a, a small introduction. Um, from Heiler. So Heiler is, a, I would say, a, a startup company uh, specialized in uh, developing, I would say, uh, agricultural machinery. And specifically, it wants to work on uh, on side crops, I would say, or uh, I would say uh, upcoming crops uh, like fiber plants, straw, miscanthus, hemp, canna, flax. So not the standard, uh, I would say, known crops. 
Uh, and these crops are becoming more and more important because of the uh, different challenges in the um, uh, link to, for example, Green Deal or circularity. Uh, these uh, these plants have uh, quite some advantages uh, in uh, in several areas. So we are making specific machines to uh, to harvest them uh, or to do other actions with the, with the plants um, to uh, to get that uh, that working. So we are in very close contact with the farmers. And in this project, we also wanted to work on a kind of data layer uh, whereby the farmer immediately and also other stakeholders have access to, to data uh, gathered during the, um, the harvesting of the, uh, of the plants. Um, so we are a Belgian company, uh, I forgot to mention that. So uh, why did we join the Atlas Network? Because as a small company, it is important to make the right decisions when you start doing something with, with data. Uh, because we wanted to uh, combine the, the machinery also with immediately a data layer on top of it um, to, uh, to help the whole ecosystem. Because in, in, in the hemp chain, uh, for example, uh, everybody knows everybody, more or less. Uh, so it's a quite small community, it's growing. Uh, so we need to uh, share the data with all possible stakeholders. And um, we also wanted to make sure if we change exchange data, uh, for example, of hemp harvesting, uh, I would say, for example, quality uh, data uh, with the uh, processing uh, factory afterwards, that this is done in the, I would say, in a future-proof way. Uh, and that's the that's the reason why we joined uh, why we joined Atlas uh, to make sure that we can uh, exchange in the future with other stakeholders, other software companies, other interested stakeholders in, in a kind of standardized uh, way. Uh, that's that's uh, that's why we joined the uh, the network. Um, so what did we develop? It's a hemp data share. It's a kind of combination of uh, of uh, gathering data during the harvesting here you see some pictures of the uh, two machines brand new machines which have been used in this project uh, to uh, harvest hemp uh, because hemp is a is a quite difficult uh, plant to to harvest we also want to make sure that it's cut in two perfectly as you can see on the right picture uh, we also want to have a, a configurable length of uh, the the two parts for example and this should all be data steered, but also we should also have the data gathered during the, the harvesting. So we developed an, um, uh, an application where farmers can send their, their tasks to it and their fields, and also inversely that yield data is coming back in, to, to them, in, but also to other people who are interested in having this data. For example, um, in this project, we also work together with a processing company wanted to know uh, how much of the hemp was coming, and what is the length, what is the quality, so that they could uh, adjust or, or their, their machinery before the, uh, the hemp would arrive uh, at the processing uh, plant. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, um, the challenges we wanted to address uh, with, uh, with the hemp data share was uh, First of all, of course, to have data sharing possible with farmers uh, while the machines were on the field, on the to have data on the yield of the upcoming uh, upcoming fibers. Uh, but we also wanted to uh, have an easy exchange of data, also with other software companies or farm management systems or industry, um, to have the standardized, I would say, dictionary vocabulary offered, or at least. Uh, made available by the Atlas uh, Consortium uh, to make sure that we are speaking the same language with everybody. And of course, the other challenge we wanted to address here, because as I already said, the hemp uh, community is a smaller community, but growing. And we also wanted to, I would say, uh, disseminate them and all the stakeholders on, on data, because uh, uh, it's still, uh, I would say, a green field there. In terms of data gathering, data sharing. So by by doing this project and also talking about it, showing it, uh, this was also the third uh, challenge, of course, to, to to get them, I would say, uh, on board on this uh, data uh, data layer. Um, so this time data share, the benefits uh, is, uh, of course, we have extra data, extra data coming now from this uh, initial market. Uh, 
can be interesting and for everybody. We also uh, wanted to have this uh, data exchange very discoverable right? to share, for example, the yield information, to share the field information and the tasks to do within the fields. Um, and of, of course, as already said, uh, to have the standardized uh, uh, and documented data model. And here you see some pictures of our, I would say, web-based application where you can see uh, the different machines, uh, documentation, the farmer can see the, the uh, if the field has been harvested or uh, it's in, is it in progress and so on. And afterwards, other partners can uh, get the data from the API um, to get, for example, the yield data and the quality data of the uh, harvested hemp. Uh, so th this was, uh, this was, I would say, in this in this niche market, an eye opener, and and we are working continuously further on this uh, on this data around uh, hemp but also flax, but maybe other plants in the future uh, to, to get the data, uh, I would say, knowledge also in these niche markets uh, used more and more. The advantage to have it in the niche market is, of course, that you can start with the, with the green field solution. So by, by, by getting your fundamentals uh, correct, uh, this can save a lot of time in the future in terms of data, uh, data sharing. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you uh, and thank you also the Atlas uh, Consortium to uh, uh, to have us on board. Eh? And uh, I would like to give now back the word to Insighting for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Kun, and thank you, Stefan, Florian, and Paul. I think that was very, very informative, uh, and I hope our participants were able to digest most of the information. But don't worry, we will have now the question and answer session again, and they will be able to ask you all the questions that they uh, came up to their minds. Um, all right, let's see what questions we are receiving. Okay, I'm seeing some of them now already there. Stefan, there is one for you. It says, what kind of technology are you using to provide your services? Oh, yeah, thank you. I think there was um, some explanation already in the video uh, that we mostly focus on the satellite data, but we add other sources of information uh, like uh, weather data models we operationally use in our systems and we apply on that with weather data, satellite data, uh, open satellite data. Uh, we have like crop modeling techniques uh, to produce the outputs. In this case, for example, for the crop um, harvest maturity service, um, we use also ground truth data coming uh, from DLG, for example, from Floyan, um, uh, where we can um, have some reference data, apply the modeling then on that together with the weather and satellite data, and this creates an, uh, hopefully a very useful output, but <laughs> that's what we are all together uh, have tested in, the, in this uh, project. All right, thank you, Stefan. There is another question coming for Florian. It says, how does pre-harvest identification help in agriculture in your view, Florian? Yeah, that helps. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, thank you. The pre-harvest determination is, is uh, crucial as a farmer gets to know um, uh, which fields are ready for harvest and which are not. And uh, the current process of determining which fields are ready for harvest and which are not uh, is currently very time consuming. And yeah, as a farmer uh, has to survey all the fields to determine uh, time of, of, of harvest yeah. and which uh, or, or with, with the pre-harvest service the farmer can rank which fields are ready for harvest and when that's the uh, mm -hmm. main information for the farmer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good very good Florian all right next one uh, Paul this one is for you you mentioned that the forecast is a step towards optimized crop scheduling what are the next steps the way we currently for the Atlas community developed our solution is, is basically individualistic in the sense that, that a single farmer can use the solution uh, for, for her own um, um, purpose and to really um, achieve true harmonization uh, across um, a community's short supply chain. We would have to communicate um, um, uh, farmer per farmer and, and, and collectively um, either indeed with direct communication that that for example Calabi would facilitate or we would have to sort of nudge um, the end users into 
into uh, making some the decisions based on the on the um, on on the analytics analytics that we provide. Um, maybe it's a bit comparable. Maybe for um, like uh, Google Maps. If you use if you use Google Maps, then then in the first use case, you would only use it to um, get directions. Just you know, get the shortest distance. But if you really want to think about, okay, what's the best way to globally tackle, you know, uh, uh, traffic uh, optimization, then um, then you would need to go one step further and and not just um, lead everybody to the shortest route, but maybe even start, you know, um, directing traffic uh, like orchestrating traffic flows, um, and and similarly. The, the demand forecast of Calabi is currently in the, in the in the in the state that it's used as a as a single use solution, but we would um, need to orchestrate and then serve that um, sort of um, aggregated um, um, optimization uh, to the the end users. All right, that was very comprehensive. Thank you, Paul. And also, thank you for providing an example. I think that's the best way to digest new information. So thanks for that. Um, and Kuhn, we have one for you. Why is Atlas enablement and interoperability, of course, important for you? I guess for everyone, but this one is for you. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Yes, indeed. It's, it's very important for us. And I think for most of us, of course, but especially as a machine construction company uh, in the niche market, um, it's very important that we get the things done correctly on the first day. We, are, we don't have the resources to make all kinds of API links with all kinds of software programs and uh, industry. So we want to, I would say, benefit from the work done in the last years in, uh, I would say, these data platforms uh, or data exchange platforms um, to, to benefit from that because uh, yeah, like I said, if tomorrow another uh, industry is coming in the north of France or in Germany, wants to have data, we can also say, have a look to the uh, Atlas offered service, I would say. You can find the quotation, have a look, and you can uh, easily uh, get data if, if, if you want. Um, that makes it uh, much easier for, uh, I would say, a, a scale-up company like, like Hyde. <clears throat> Yeah, just to also highlight, it's true, it's that exchange, but more than a platform, we have a network. So with Atlas, we provide, we, we rather call it as a network, but indeed, uh, it's very much uh, directed in this explanation. Um, I see another question for Stefan. Uh, it says, what is the frequency of crop status updates? Um, status updates, that's the, yeah, that you have to reflect the nature of satellite data on the one side. Um, that means satellites are, or these open satellites we are using are passing every five to ten, day, ten days. They have a useful image, it's uh, visual cell, um, imagery, so it can be obscured by clouds. Um, so in Germany, I would say five to ten days is a good average in the summer. Um, but to overcome this, we also introduce the weather data and the modeling, which allows us to, use, to give a daily updates even um, through the modeling techniques. Um. <coughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And I think we'll go for the last one or last two. Uh, Florian, is for you. Uh, which qualities in winter with cultivation can be controlled by pre-harvest determination? Oh, yeah, that's I'm a good stupid. question. That's a good question. And as in addition to the crude protein uh, of, of wheat, uh, other important parameters are uh, of great significance. Uh, one of this is the falling number. A uh, falling number which has a decisive influence on the backing properties from the wheat. And uh, with some wheat varieties, uh, this is very strongly uh, too dependent on the weather. And uh, the, that means um, that if this uh, wheat is on the harvest in the optimal time, and there are also external influence, uh, such as weather, for example, uh, rainfall, uh, then the bakery uh, or the baking um, quality suffers from the wheat. All right. Thank you, Florian. And we'll go with two more. There are both four. No, there is one for Kuhn and another one for Paul. So Kuhn, 
this for you. Is your solution replicable in other crops or fibers and countries? Yes, uh, as I said in the presentation also, um, the, uh, the solution is certainly uh, available for other crops um, and uh, other countries, certainly countries, eh? and we can do hemp in different countries, of course, but also the crops uh, by by the standardized data model, um, we can we can use it in other crops uh, in, in the different countries. That's not a problem. All right, and Paul, this is a bit um, well, kind of related. Um, so, will the forecast services be available in all regions or only where they operate? Um, so, currently, indeed, only in the regions where we operate, uh, we we are um, providing the. Um, the the active forecast uh, solutions uh, the video actually that that is linked will give more details about this um but we are providing uh, a so-called passive forecasting so so the passive forecasting is really based on um <coughs> public available data and and general correlations that have to do with weather and holiday seasons but if you really want to use the active data that really uses point of sale results uh then then indeed um it does rely on the on the Calabi data so so then it it um it currently only is available in the regions that Calabi is operating in but we are definitely also um eyeing with the the, the hope and momentum of of atlas to um make available that that active forecast solution also in the regions that that Atlas is operating. Exactly. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you everyone for this session. I think you all did an outstanding job. So now let's move on to the next uh, cluster, to the next speakers, and we'll go all the way to Romania, where our next speaker, Ayar N, will be introducing the Innovation Hub from Murfatlar Vineyards together with the Open Call winners, Denis Vicina from Chet Electronics and Klen Hosha from AEDIT, both coming from Italy, uh, and they will be dealing with solutions to combat challenges related to weed and pest control management. Without further ado, I will then pass the screen over to you, Ayar. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I'll present you the Innovation Hub number three from uh, Morfatla, Romania. Uh, I'll start with a uh, short introduction of our uh, research unit. So we are a uh, institution um, uh, for viticulture and uh, enology established in the uh, southeast of Romania uh, that is uh, more than one century old and uh, it manages over uh, 160 hectares of uh, vineyards, uh, of which uh, 50 of them are managed in the organic system. Nearby us, there are more than uh, 50 profile companies that uh, manage over 8,000 uh, hectares of uh, vineyards. So um, one of our main objectives is to uh, bring progress to all of these uh, companies. Um, as uh, partners in the Atlas uh, network, we work as a uh, pilot uh, to conduct studies uh, regarding the targeted applications and uh, for uh, plant protection. And also, we work as a innovation hub in order to promote uh, the Atlas network uh, through uh, demonstrative days and uh, publishing papers and articles, and also uh, organize the uh, workshop. So, uh, our solutions for the uh, Atlas platform um, for us, it is important to create a digital ecosystem that has an impact on the uh, decision-making actions regarding pest control and uh, pest management. So, uh, therefore, uh, we installed uh, four weather stations in our area that uh, collect data regarding uh, weather forecast uh, and also um, you know, disease installment. We also tested a uh, hyperspectral camera uh, that uh, gives us data regarding early disease installment and uh, identification, which is uh, a very important uh, aspect. Uh, we also tested apps within the Atlas networks, and uh, one such app, uh, it's called the Digipest, uh, it has been developed by uh, Edit from Italy. Uh, and we have a short video of uh, one of our farmers uh, that tested the app, and here is a review uh, of his experience. Uh, 
the farmers describes exactly the difference between conventional ways of uh, managing and uh, also um, uh, detecting uh, disease installments and uh, comparing to the uh, app that he uses, uh, the DigiPath app that he uses uh, for uh, detection uh, in an intelligent manner, let's say. Right? Okay, so uh, what are what uh, were our challenges in the Atlas network? So um, we selected uh, three major points uh, to highlight uh, the first one being the obvious one is the, um, the use uh, of overuse of the pesticides in the, in the vineyards um, um, that have a negative impact on the human health and also uh, damaging the environment. Uh, the second point uh, being the um, difficulties of uh, sending data and receiving data uh, throughout the Atlas networks uh, from uh, all of uh, the partners. And the uh, third one being the establishment of the innovation path here in Romania, because many of the companies nearby are not accustomed to uh, uh, data transfers and uh, they're more inclined to use the uh, their own ways to manage their their environments. So, what are the benefits of using the uh, Atlas network? So, uh, the first one being the uh, implement implementation of the uh, a advanced packet news system for pesticides uh, that have a uh, cost uh, reduction effect, but also time saving uh, actions. Uh, therefore. Uh, it creates a uh, fast decision making uh, features uh, with uh, the data used in the ATA servers. And also, uh, it links up uh, companies uh, for uh, us to be able to un better understand the environment and also the installment of diseases in our own area. So, uh, this, is, uh, this was my presentation. So, uh, thank you very much for listening. And I'll pass the floor to uh, Denise Vicino. So thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am Denise Vicino, representing Chat Electronics. Our company historically deals with the design and production of uh, electronics and software systems. We have uh, various applications to various sectors of, of the industry and also to agriculture. We are located in the northeast uh, of Italy, in the famous region of the Prosecco wine. So application to viticulture in particular of our technologies uh, it was quite, uh, quite natural, I would say. Among our activities, uh, research and development is uh, actually our priority. We have a lot of new projects uh, going on on precision farming. And uh, we decided uh, to join the Atlas pro project because we saw in it uh, a new opportunity to spread our products, because we can uh, interconnect our products to other services of third parties that's overcoming the barrier of interoperability, which is quite uh, limiting the spread of technologies in agriculture. So let's see our solution, which is uh, summarized uh, in this uh, scheme. We propose uh, a kit for precision spraying to be mounted on a common tractor equipped with a tower sprayer. The system works with a canopy analysis made by stereo cameras, and then a system for controlling in real time the nozzles and then performing a spray uh, proportional to the amount of detected vegetation. Here you can see a visual uh, interpretation of the canopy analysis made by two uh, phases of the image analysis. First, we have a three-dimensional reconstruction of the environment, so a depth view of the environment. Then we have a detection of the, of the vegetation with the segmentation of the foliage to be targeted by the spray. And uh, last, we have a computation of the vegetation in terms of uh, meter square of, uh, of leaves, uh, which is uh, computed for each vertical section of the canopy. And each section is connected to a nozzle of the sprayer 
which has an independent control. These are uh, uh, pus with the modulation nozzles, so they can be activated in, um, for a time uh, that is proportional to the amount of vegetation which is detected. Here you can see a field test of our first version of the prototype. You can see that the sprayer is activating the nozzles only in front of the detected vegetation. This is receiving as an input a task which is assigned by the farmer or by a crop protection advisor. This task specifies when, where, and what uh, the system uh, has to do, so where to perform the spray, with which kind of products, etc. As an output, our system is um, uh, producing a map of the applied products. In this uh, simulation, you can see a rendering of the tractor and the sprayer going on, and the white uh, shadows are the layers of the products which is uh, released uh, on the on the plant and they are overlapping as the tractor is going on through the rows of the vineyard the challenges of our project uh, are mainly dealing with the difficulty to provide the best hardware and software components in order to construct a smart and reliable system for reducing the amount of plant protection products and then uh, the challenge of adapting this system to different models of tower sprayer and to the typical speed of a tractor because we do an online uh, image analysis finally making all our system compatible with the universe of atlas and in this uh, representation you can see our PSK um, device, which is uh, interconnected with, with other components of the Atlas uh, environments, some of which are uh, um, third parties uh, services, and the farmer as a user can, um, can face with other services and not uh, directly with, uh, with our devices. The benefits of our system is, first of all, the reduction of uh, phytosanitary treatments estimated by in amount by 30-50% of reduction in a season. Then the compatibility of the system with all the tower spryers, so this can be used on the new spryers, but it can also be used to revamp old spryers, so this is very important. The production of the application maps, as you see an example here, is made in a standardized format that we decided with the Atlas team. And this is very important, important because it is guaranteed that it can go through the interoperability environment of Atlas. So this map can be exchanged between various components of Atlas, can be seen from different interfaces. So I am done. Thank you very much. And I pass the floor to Clean. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. In this presentation, I'd like to introduce you DigiPest, an app for pest monitoring and crop management. My company, Edit, is an academic spin-off funded in 2001 at the Entomology Lab of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, which is one of the universities of Pisa, starting with tools and solutions applied to crop protection. IDIT comprises five persons with different skills and backgrounds, from IT to agricultural sciences. The core business of IDIT is agriculture, uh, namely the development of digital tools and services applied to the optimization of the use of input and decision support systems for farmers and for public and private sectors. Uh, I am Cleon Oxa, the developer leading the implementation of DigiPest. We took the chance of joining uh, the Atlas network to bring interoperability into our solution as a road for new market opportunities. I had it as a matured experience in developing services and tools in agriculture tailored to a variety of targets and users. DigiPest is a web app to support the sustainable management of crops currently available for olive, grapevine and maize. These two videos show the main functionalities of the app in a test farm with different fields and crop in a, and in a connection with a weather station. Here on the left, you can see how the implemented models support pest management. They provide the daily risk status uh, for the different, uh, different pests and diseases in a way that's uh, easy to understand by the user. The app supports field monitoring 
with tools able to record data and pictures from the trap readings and symptoms observed on the fruit and leaves. To facilitate the decision process, a field dashboard has been created showing the output outputs uh, of all models in the same page. Uh, the video on the right shows the decision support systems for crop irrigation and fertilization, uh, available on DigiPest to quantify and meet crop requirements in terms of water and macronutrients. For the calculation of these models, DigiPest receives uh, input from the field weather station while crop and soil data are entered by the users. Yet, these models are updated daily to provide a real-time advice on the action to be taken in the field, thus avoiding crop stress as well as waste of resources. Challenges we aim to address with DigiPest are the reduction of pesticide input because of their negative impact on health and environment, the sagacious use of water for irrigation purpose, the sustainable practice of fertilization, which if not well planned may lead to negative effects, such as greenhouse gas emission and eutrophication, and the strengthening of farmer profit. The interoperability of DigiPest will ensure the compliance, compliance sorry, uh, with different data providers. Uh, responding to the need of uh, increasing the integration among technologies and data. The benefits for the user provided by DigiPest are increasing agricultural sustainability, thus meeting the farm to fork strategy, making more efficient the use of uh, irrigation water and fertilizers, and uh, optimizing the cost for agricultural inputs and supporting high quality productions. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Back to you, Inza. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for your great presentations and also for providing very clear examples on smart. Uh, farming approaches uh, towards more sustainable practices and mainly on the use of pesticides. Um, now we'll have the next five minutes to let the audience uh, pose their questions to you. And so as usual, everyone use the chat uh, so that I go receiving them uh, and I will start reading them out loud. All right, let's see what we get. Um, Ayar, this one is for you. It says, how can the ATAS interoperability network contribute to create sustainable businesses in your context? So, uh, by linking partners uh, in order for uh, working to uh, together to minimize the uh, impact of diseases in the field. And uh, also by providing the fast making decisions, as uh, I discussed in the uh, presentation earlier. Uh, to support a better control over the company. So it's uh, uh, important to uh, have a look for the, the impact of the diseases. And that's, that's how it's meant. Um, all right, I couldn't hear completely, but um, let's move on now with the next one. Uh, Denise. There is a question for you. It says, is your precision spraying solution ready for the market? Okay, it is uh, not ready for the market yet as we are uh, still completing the second version of our uh, PSK prototype. However, I think that we need uh, one more uh, full season for the field test and this can be ready then for the market at the end of the next year, the end of uh, 2023. All right, and of course, it will be also available through the Atlas Network. That's why you all need to register. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and now let's go with Glenn. Um, it says, is DG best easily expandable or replicable for being used with other crops and pests? Yes, it is. Uh, DigiPest is currently covering uh, the cheese and support tools for olive, grapevine, and maize. Our intention is to make DigiPest multi-crops at least for some functions, while depending uh, uh, on the availability of uh, integrated pest management models we can implement. All 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Klen. Let's, there is another question for you, Ayar. Um, it says, as an innovation hub, when making companies work together, does it have an impact on reducing pesticide use and improving soil quality within your region? Uh, so, uh, for companies to work together, uh, there's a better chance of preventing diseases. So, uh, and also the unexpected, uh, unexpected external factors like uh, uh, calamities or something like that, uh, that affect the field and affect the plants and the crop yield, etc. So, uh, by um, uh, linking together companies uh, is a better uh, option to uh, reduction in reduction of the these harmful uh, substances that have a, ne a negative impact on uh, on soil quality. All right, thank you very much. I just saw another question now for Denise, which I think is also very important. What is the advantage of sensing the vegetation with a stereo vision instead of 3D leader, leader, sorry. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so we choose to use the stereo vision because differently from the three-dimensional leader, it permits to recognize the nature of the ob objects. I mean that in the image, I can uh, recognize and distinguish what is vegetation from what is, for example, the trunk of the plant or what is uh, other features of the environment. And this is important, for example, at the beginning of the season when you have a very a few vegetation of the plant, uh, this can uh, allow you uh, an advantage, uh, a reduction of uh, even 19%, uh, 80, 19% of reduction in the use of products with respect to the leader. So this is a bit more uh, uh, challenging from the computational point of view, but we are facing it, but it has a great advantage in, the, uh, in saving the products. Mm -hmm. All right, well done, Denise. And um, let's finish up this with Glenn. Uh, it says, what about the exploitation of targets achieved by your app thanks to Atlas? Are there opportunities for your company here? Uh, opportunities open to our business thanks to Atlas interoperability tools are to provide our diffusion support systems and uh, models, which, is, which are our specific expertises. Uh, to farm management information system of other companies, si uh, since data acquisition is more easier, much easier. Uh, and also to facilitate the interoperability with uh, agricultural machineries by means of the Atlas Equipment Center. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Denise. And thank you, Ayar, for your great uh, answers. I think we can now wrap up um, the first part of our event and we will move to the break. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes for this, but before you leave us, uh, I would like you all to pay attention to the chat because we will use a hashtag so you can uh, quickly join and answer uh, two questions that we will pose to you. Um, again, you will be able to see this and we would like to gather your input on your first impressions about the Atlas network and the use cases presented thus far. All right, so now I let you go, I stretch your legs, uh, grab any coffee, tea, whatever you want, and we will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you all. See you in a bit. Thank you. Gracias a Ben.
All right, we are back now from the break. I hope you have time to relax a bit and uh, refresh yourself so that we can now follow our second part of the event. Um, again, we I will not be reporting the answers that you have provided um, in the chat through, uh, during the break, but thank you very much for, for this input. It's very valuable for us to know where we stand and how we are communicating with the audience and our um, yeah, future possible uh, participants uh, about the Atlas Network. Uh, now we will move to the second part, as I said before, and we, if you want to know the details, particulars about the agenda, um, you will be able to see the link to the to the precise agenda in the chat. So please click there, and you, if you are impatient, don't worry, um, you will have there all the details that you need to know. Um, otherwise, I will just inform you that we are now um, going to the next presentations. It will be provided the, by the next two innovation hubs and uh, four open call, remaining open call winners who will represent again uh, their use cases, the challenges they are uh, overcoming with the solutions that they will provide through Atlas. And so this will be um, coming next. And after this, um, after they present their solutions to tackle challenges related to weed and pest control and asset tracking and fleet management, we'll move and finalize this uh, event with a panel discussion on digital agriculture and uh, food systems and their um, important role to reach uh, net zero. So please stay put and let's go then to the presentations led by Peteris uh, Skrastins from our Latvian Innovation Hub, together with the Open Call winners uh, 2021, Davide Veltre, Spray Logics, and Marcus Moro of Tornia from Italy and Austria. Peteris, the screen is yours. <laughs> Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Peter and uh, I will tell you about uh, innovation hubs here in Latvia. So uh, we are uh, three partners involved in activities with Atlas Innovation Hubs and uh, we focus on uh, irrigation, disease and frost prognosing and uh, sensor-based uh, uh, decision help service. And uh, as you see, five uh, uh, demonstration farms all over Latvia serve as basis of uh, our innovation hubs. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why we join uh, the Atlas uh, are uh, problems with uh, equipment uh, compatibility from different manu manufacturers or farmers faced with. So, uh, therefore, farmers are interested in some universal, let's say, solutions that would help with interoperability of equipment and uh, also software. So, let's take uh, insight in one of our innovation hubs. The Berry Garden Farm Kruogzen specializes in the business of commercial black currants. Currently, the farm operates 63 hectares of orchards growing black currants, sea buckthorns, and apple trees. This is one of the largest organic food farms in Latvia. One of the biggest challenges in food growing in Latvia in recent years is growth. Although this problem in Latvia is not as big as in South Europe, Nevertheless, due to the climate change, the impact of raw on harvest is becoming more and more significant. Irrigation significantly affects not only the harvest, but also the quality of the berries. In turn, the quality of production significantly affects farmers' revenues and profits. For example, in 2021, only those orchards with irrigation systems manage to obtain a sufficiently high quality yield. In some regions of Latvia, the differences between farms with and without irrigation systems affected the crop more than eight times. Therefore, smart agricultural solutions for irrigation in Europe are becoming more and more important. Also, due to the climate change, Early detection of diseases and their sustainable control will play an important role in future challenges. Sensor-based agriculture plays an important role in the planning of technological processes in a specific farm area. Yeah, 
Yes, that was uh, about one of our innovation hubs. And um, uh, some challenges that have uh, emerged. So if you look uh, here at the average size of uh, farm in the European Union, we find that 85% of farms are uh, on the smaller size, no larger than 20 hectares. And uh, those facts are important uh, also regarding Atlas solutions, because uh, for uh, smaller farms, the uh, problem makes maintenance of technologies. For example, in case of, in case of emergency, because uh, service providers, they give priority to large farms. And therefore, uh, farmers would uh, like to see those smart technologies become more farmer friendly so that they can just uh, plug and go. And uh, to summarize uh, all about, uh, the new course based on green thinking uh, makes uh, pressure on farmer and especially or on or organic farms so to tend to uh, sensible use of virus uh, conventional means and uh, methods. And therefore, interoperability in smart agriculture, uh, Atlas deals with, are uh, of uh, great importance in order to find uh, a balance between high yields, uh, quality, and uh, reasonable production expenses, also here in Northeast Europe. And uh, that was about innovation hubs in Latvia. And now I want to pass the floor to some of our open call winners in this area. And first will be David from Sprite Logistics. Thank you very much, Petris. Hi, everyone. My name is David Veltre. I'm the product manager of Spry Logics. Spry Logics is a small startup company located in Trento, which is a small city in the northern part of Italy. We are, this is actually a beautiful area. We are surrounded by the Dolomite Mountains and we have a unique climate condition. And probably it is exactly thanks to this particular climate condition that we are the leader in apple and wine grape production. In fact, despite, despite the small size of this land, we account basically three quarters of the total Italian production of apple and 15% of the total European production a similar value even for the apple, for the wine grape. But unfortunately, there is a backside of being the leader in the production of those crops, which is the exposure to chemical agents. In fact, the amount of treatment made on top of those crops in a season is close to 40, which means 70 kilos of chemicals product each hectare of planted soil, a big number. And actually one of the reasons because we decided to join Atlas Network was actually to promote and to, to offer to the farmer an effective solution to lessen the amount of chemical in agriculture. In talking about this topic, I would say that it's very important to talk even about the methodology that is used nowadays to deliver this plant protection product, which is through the mist blower. This the instrument basically just nebulized the product all around the tree, creating a big cloud all around the tree. But unfortunately, the researcher says that with this method, just 20% of the product gets actually on the leaves and it stays on top of the leaves. The rest 80% basically becomes just pollution. It gets carried on by the, the wind and deposited on the ground or water courses. And unfortunately, we already know the dramatic effects that those products have on the environment and on humans too. Spray Logics, thanks to its experience in the world of optical technology, created these sensors that is able to recognize the plant leaves and therefore the size of the plant. And this sensor system is implemented with some solenoid valve, which can basically open or close the inflow from the relevant nozzles according to certain condition. So um, can be the density of the foliar apparatus of this or the size of the plant. And with this methodology, we can actually greatly reduce the amount of chemical in, in the agriculture. <clears throat> and I would like even to spend a couple of seconds to talk about the importance that the Atlas Network have had and still having for our project for the development of our system and some implementation. 
in recently we were using one of the service that atlas network offers which is atlas field data service and thanks to this service we were actually able to locate exactly located the field we were looking for we were able to understand what crop was planted on it plus the access path to reach the the, the field plus very important all the list of the chemical treatment that have been made on top of that area those information are very important to us because combined with the information that uh, collected by our sensor we are now in the in the in the process of creating a, a real effective uh, spraying uh, a management system which will be an actually another implementation on our on our uh, solution and will be able to improve even more the efficiency of our product so basically uh summarizing all my speech i would say that the challenge was pretty hard but uh, the outcome that uh, uh, we we are achieving with our solution it offers manifold uh, benefit to the farmers because for sure the first one will be a reduction of usage of chemical products which will have an immediate benefit on the economy of the farm then the uh, our our uh, solution will record all the application the chemical application that the farmer is making in the in the field plus automatically uh, filling up the spraying application log which is a must that any farmer has to do at the end of the treatment plus uh, the system will keep on collecting the information and data from the field and so will allow us to keep on monitoring uh, the the condition of our of our plantation unfortunately the time for me is uh, coming to an end it's time for me to head over to my colleague marcus moro for his presentation for optronia company thank you very much for the time today i'm happy to answering all your questions in case you have one later thank you very much thank you very much davide and i will now present the optronia solution for weed detection and selective spring so welcome to this presentation. My name is Marcus Moro, and I'm the product owner of Optronic in the Hub. So before we will dive into a solution, I want to introduce our company to you. Optronia creates novel features and adds new values, customer values to high-tech devices. And we achieve this by adding sites to those uh, devices. We mainly operate in the farming industry, where we can make best use of our core competences, which are optics design, embedded engineering, and data science. And as you can see, we are also very proud of having a highly motivated and skilled and also diverse team here located in Innsbruck in Austria. I want to introduce our main products to you, what we are working on. So here on the top right, you can see a farm detection system. So we have a, a, a spectral sensor, which detects farms. You can see it here in the picture, little farms hiding in the grass uh, on the first huts in the spring. So our sensor detects the farms and sends an alarm to the land machine, which then immediately lifts up the mower and stops the land machine in order to save the animal and also to not cont contaminate the cut of grass. This product is in, or has been released already, and they are in full swing for us to production for 2023. And of course, we are also working on the weed spot spraying system, which is the, the main topic of this presentation, or uh, weed detection and selective spraying solution. So what uh, drives us to join the Atlas network? The market, and also regulations, they demand reduction of chemicals. So in our case, mostly herbicides for uh, killing of weeds. So these weeds are, as we know, a big danger for humans, animals, and biodiversity in general. So we can focus now with this network on our core competencies, which are the development of these sensors, which significantly reduce the usage of this uh, chemical products. And with this cooperation, we can get external partners on board, which then together with us 
have a fast integration of very sophisticated features. Furthermore, this interoperability network is a strategic advantage because there are many players in the field. It's a fast changing environment with so many different manufacturers. Now I want to show you our solution. So we have this wheel spot spraying sensor, which is the, the heart of the system. You can see it here in the, in, on the top. So we have a green or brown detection system, which means we detect plants on soil. So the first application is that we detect weeds and selectively spray only the weeds. So depending on field conditions and how much weed there is in the field, we can reduce the usage of chemicals up to 90%. Our sensor, as you can see here in the picture, we have a very sophisticated optics. So optical lenses you can see here in the top, which then base downwards in the operation. And by this, we can achieve a resolution. So the sensor can see uh, plants to down to the size of two square centimeters. And this also works for up to 25 kilometers an hour, as you can see here in the picture, even our reference targets are flying around. So it's, it's really, really fast. Other big benefits of our system are that it's very easy setup. It's not uh, sensitive to the angle, how you mount it. Also, the, the height is variable. So we achieved by a patented technology that you can mount a sensor from 8 to 120 centimeters and you still have this very good detection performances, as you've just heard. Furthermore, you do not need any calibration. You can just mount it once to attract and go to any field you want and do not need to set up something in the beginning. Just turn it on and go. And also very, very big benefit, also, especially compared to other solutions in the market, is that it is completely independent of external light. So you can go at daytime, at night. It can be cloudy. It doesn't really matter at all. It's independent to external illumination or light. So here in this video, you can see the top view of the sensor viewing the ground with the targets. And below you see the, the measurement values the sensor evaluates. And on the right, you see the, the nozzles then activated once a, a plant is detected. So what we achieved here is that the sensor only sees significant information. So we use the whole complex system and only get the information we need to uh, classify plants to soil. And by doing this, we can create a, a creative system which is very, very fast, very efficient and robust to environmental conditions. What we achieved is a measurement rate of 500 measurements per second, and this for each single sensor on the boom. Okay, however, with just reduction of chemicals and reduction of cost, we didn't want to stop. We asked ourselves, how can we gain further value to the customer? And further value means we want to increase the yield for the customer. And we can do this by measuring the plans, the location, the growth status, and putting this together to a prediction algorithm. But for this algorithm, we need more information. And this is exactly where Atlas comes into play for us. So Atlas can provide the location of the field, type of crop, and especially what has happened before to this field. Have there been any other diseases detected by different sensor systems? Which products have been used? How was the weather the last weeks and months? So Atlas provides us this framed field, as you can see here in the picture, and the history of what has been, what has been done before. We provide a very detailed measurement on which plants are there, what's the size, how did they change in size, what's the health status, growth status, other diseases. And if we put all of this together to this uh, uh, Atlas services, we can then create predictions on how to treat the field. So the farmer, as we've seen in other presentations before, this farmer sits at the cafe and having a coffee and get the information that yeah, it's better to spray tomorrow because the day after it will rain and your plants are ready to be sprayed if they need it. So we can create this field mapping where we have all the information together, 
do predictions and adjust their treatment locally on the field. Yeah, thank you very much for listening in. And yeah, I'm also happy to answer some questions afterwards. Thank you very much. And now I'll hand over back to Inza to the studio. Great, thank you very much, um, Marcus and everyone for your great presentations. And I think now we will see the first questions coming through. Again, a reminder, everybody use the chat to post your questions, comments, concerns uh, about the presentations that you have just seen uh, from all Davide, Marcus and Peteris. Um, all right, let's see what we get. Peteris, this one is for you. In your presentation, you said small farmers have problems with timely repair of equipment um, in the event of an emergency. Why is that? Uh, in our region, uh, equipment manufacturer service uh, network are, uh, let's say, bad developed. And in case of uh, damage caused, for example, by storm, uh, dealers uh, uh, first sell large farms, but uh, small farmers have to wait in line. Uh, we had several causes during the season when equipment stopped functioning, uh, but uh, repairmen uh, do not come for a weeks. And uh, so we hope Atlas will help to solve this. Very good. Um, I see one for you, Marcus. Um, in closing the presentation, you talk about possible new features. And you also mentioned field mapping. Which are the relevant parameters that you will collect to compose this map? And what could be the useful outcome of this field mapping for a farmer? That might work. Okay, thank you very much for the question. So first of all, our sensor, uh, sensor detects the presence of wheat and also the size and location of it. But furthermore, we can also detect the, the health status of the, the plant itself. So it could be also crops we can detect or measure. Furthermore, we can also uh, see different diseases. So we can see the trend of different measurements, different days. So we have a very detailed and also locally on a very small scale, detailed information on the field. So if we put this to the Atlas service and combine this with other measurement data, we can get to this prediction algorithm, which can then tell the farmer, okay, now it's time to spray this product, or now it's time to spray that product, or maybe it's enough of this product to spray it enough. I mean, imagine usually farmers, they just spray because they used to spray a different or a special product once in a month, for example. And with this mm -hmm. detailed information and this field map, we can create this very optimized treatment of the fields. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And Davide, there is another question for you. Uh, can SprayLogix sensor system satisfy the European Green Deal to reduce chemicals by 50%? Thank you very much for this, uh, for this very important question. <clears throat> yes, actually, in projecting our solution, we were aware about this uh, European Commission aim to lessen the chemical usage by 50% within 2030. And actually, our technology goes exactly in this direction, sometimes even exceeding the 50% target set up by the Commission. Uh, we took some tests in a fully developed uh, uh, vineyard and uh, we found uh, a saving of the water in the tank uh, up to 50% and similar result we achieved in a fully developed apple orchard. And when I'm talking about fully developed apple orchard i'm talking about a situation that basically the, the the apple trees are forming a perfect green wall but all the farmers know that it is very hard to achieve this perfect green wall and most of the time we will have some empty spot in between one plant to another or some plants that are less developed compared to the other i will give you an example an early uh, stage of an apple uh, an apple orchard where the planters have just been planted there and are very young the plant will be very skinny very short uh, very small so in a situation like this probably the plants need even more protection to a fully developed plant 
but uh, uh, of course in a situation like that uh, where there are a lot of empty gap we can even save up to 80 percent of the plant protection product so basically at the end uh, to close my uh, the, the answer yes we definitely can uh, be so the solution to achieve the, the green deal uh, to comply to the, to the commission aim let's say thank you very good, Davide. I think that was very comprehensive. And again, uh, thank you for providing an example. I think that always helps. Um, and I think we can conclude this with Peteris. There is another question for you. It says, you spoke only about IoT sensors in your innovation hub. Do you also have some mark kit installed on tractors or harvesting machines like we've seen in the video? Um, yes, uh, we are in process to install all of uh, uh, auto spotters. It's a boost conversion kit for sprayer also. Uh, but uh, for example, for harvester, we do not have uh, smart solutions for today. Hope once in future, uh, all this equipment will be fully robotized. Hope Atlas will help. All right. Thank you very much, Petenis. I think I'll wrap up this session now. Uh, thank you, um, three speakers, for your great contributions. Um, and now we will move on to the final joint uh, session. Um, this time we will have an innovation hub led by Peter, Pe Peter Frohlich from the Frohlich Farm in Switzerland, followed by Stefan Schmieder from Hansenhof, also based in, uh, sorry, he is based in or Hasenhoff is based in Germany, and Claudio Salvadori from New Generation Sensors in Italy, offering all of them solutions to overcome uh, various challenges. It's a bit of a, uh, everything we have um, yeah, from fleet management uh, and asset tracking to uh, also from farm to fork uh, related challenges. So if you are all here with me, I will then pass the screen over to you, Peta and then you can pass uh, your screen to the open call winners that I just introduced. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, presenting you the Innovation Hub 5 Switzerland, uh, Fröhlich Farm. So Fröhlich Farm is a farm that's moving into regenerative agriculture and also is a, a lot into digitalization. You see a nice uh, picture here. It's close to Zurich Airport, so it's also nicely reachable in the center of Europe. The team behind the farm is uh, actually my parents, so my father and my mother, plus uh, me and my partner Yvonne with our kids. Um, well, the farm has a number of challenges, which are great to actually test uh, digital tools. So first, it's, uh, it's small. It's actually around 30 hectares, which is reflecting a lot of farms or a big stake of farms around the globe and uh, therefore a good kind of playground to test different tools. Uh, also the fields have, and you see it here, have quite challenging shapes. You have uh, forest borders, their slopes up to actually more than 25%. So it's also challenging for robotics and, and, and other means. And that makes it great to demonstrate actually almost anything. Well, what's a bit of a challenge to us is we are a small farm. There is no specific infrastructure to this. There is uh, no specific financing. We run different projects actually to have this, let's say, real environment to, to test different things and have therefore projects running on biodiversity, on digitalization, uh, and actually on precision farming on the farm. And the idea is always to find economically viable implementations and solutions. Uh, a reason here is that usually farms of that size do not invest too much into machineries and, 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 and such items. So there is a challenge here and this is what we want to overcome. Now, in the project so far, we have mainly been a, a location where there was a tested decision support so we had different things going on here we had tests with sprayers we had tests of application maps we have tests of soil sampling tests of fertilization so it's quite a lot going on um, we also had tests with acid tracking and uh, that's what you're gonna see right after 
actually my presentation. But you see here, we have task management that's going to be tested and is tested. We have uh, hazardous areas where we actually look into, so where can you drive on a field and where not? We have the asset tracking, we have drilling maps where we have variable rates drilling and all the data flow in the Atlas environment behind it. The same for satellite data, for soil sampling, targeted crop protection, what you see here on the left image and targeted fertilization. Um, I think the benefits we offer here is that the applications, they get tested in a real life environment. Also, we look at the practicability in the challenging environment and also economical viability. We represent a large number of farms that should actually be transformed in, and, and digitalized and, and therefore are a good playground to do that. And we are strongly looking into sustainability on the farm also. So we're doing uh, climate balances and, and uh, life cycle assessments here, which then also flow into all the tasks we are performing and where we look into how we can collect emission data and emission reductions then can be proven with unalterable data. So that's kind of one of the big benefits that we can offer here. That's it already from my side. So thank you very much. And I would like to hand over now to Hansenhof, Stefan Schmieder to actually show more about, um, about uh, yeah, his solution. First, um, thank you, uh, uh, Peter Fröhlich for the Matthias introduction. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Stefan Schmieder. I'm the CEO of uh, Hansenhof Electro. Um, on the other hand, I have also a small farm. It means I'm also a little bit a farm. Yes, here you can see my, uh, the team of Hansenhof Electronic, which worked uh, uh, on our uh, Atlas project, uh, FDX7. And uh, Hansenhof Electronic, uh, uh, the small company, what do we do? We work in two directions. On the one hand, uh, we develop and produce ESOBAS uh, ECUs for several OEMs. Um, also, we are a member of the IF and several uh, work groups of the IF. Um, on the other hand, uh, we offer our Isobus portal for Odokus. Um, uh, and together with Odokus, uh, we produce uh, data loggers from uh, small data loggers to our Isobus data loggers. And important is also that we, that we, um, uh, develop and produce identification solutions for for implements, also from the small beacon uh, up to uh, uh, the big uh, isobus uh, identificator, uh, which has more possibilities. So, um, the, the challenges we are facing. Um, um, based on the problem that uh, that's a that's a population uh, uh, looks more to uh, more and more to food quality, the ecological fingerprint of the, the agricultural processes. Often um, we uh, we see uh, in the in the news. Uh, the bad farmer with the big machines which destroy the soil and, um, and produces a lot of CO2. But um, it's not true that, uh, the, that the farmer uh, produces CO2 uh, the, with the growing of the plants. Uh, the farmer takes uh, uh, CO2 from the earth and produces oxygen. Um, uh, the whole production chain um, 
uh, has to be tracked to uh, be able to show uh, that uh, that the farmer makes a good job. Now our our epic seven bullshit comes into the play. Days of our FDX7 is uh, our uh, data level. Uh, uh, but uh, a lot of farms uh, use uh, contractors for several works, but the contractor has other systems uh, to, uh, to collect the data. Uh, but we need, uh, we need this data to have the whole chain. And at this point, we need an interoperability solution like our Atlas. If the farmer runs, for example, implements, also it has to be equipped uh, for, uh, for the recognizing of the cultural practice. Uh, in this way, we can track the cure and with the cure, the CO2 consumption or what, uh, or what the farmer produces from the tool. But um, uh, between, uh, between the, the harvest and the dealer, also this must be tracked and uh, the loads are. Um, are recognized via the beacon, which is uh, which could be equipped uh, uh, at the trailer and also uh, harvested. All the data uh, uh, were transferred to, to our server, and the dealer has access to this information where this was harvested. Also, there came the Atlas Inclusive account. Based um, on this uh, collected agricultural data, we can provide um, interesting uh, information like the CO2 footprint. Uh, with the mobile FDX7 uh, app, the customer can, can check uh, uh, is this, this product uh, um, uh, um, an original product, uh, the sustainability, and for example, the CO2 footprint. One remark uh, this uh, bottle of, um, of beer uh, took, the CO, uh, took the CO2 from the earth, but a small car blows in two kilometers into the earth. Um, our benefits from our solution. Uh, we have with our solution that uh, customers uh, can make the, the right decision. Uh, they can track the food or uh, the beer or what, whatever, which, uh, which materials, uh, which CO2 was um, uh, was um, in the, was used, um, and uh, it gives the farmer and uh, manufacturer the possibility to show the quality of products is far more than just a simple color here on uh, packaging. Uh, using Atlas, uh, we are able to get the missing links in the tracking chain by connecting a variety of data sources to get the bigger picture. I say thank you very much for the attention. I will be happy to answer your questions after the following presentation of Claudia. The floor is yours. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Pedro Salvadori. I am representing New Generation Sensors and I'm going to present uh, our solution it is called the uh, track one toward a secure and trusted, uh, trusted perishable goods supply chain. So our 
company is founded in 2015. We are a spin-off of an important university in Italy that is Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa. We develop IoT solutions uh, from the field toward the cloud, having a variegated experience on uh, developing IoT devices since our technology is completely proprietary, so hardware and software. We have experience and expertise on cloud platform and, uh, in, um, and application. And then uh, we have also expertise on blockchain. The team is very small, but is very dense of expertise. And we are supported by uh, an old, uh, a senior uh, manager that was working in a very important company uh, and being a, a very high, high level manager. And uh, we have also a production setup since our uh, partner is uh, involved in our, in, in our projects. Our product, uh, products are essentially related to two domains. One is smart logistics, one is smart factory. And here we are starting to speech we want to speak about our solution regarding smart logistics. In fact, we have developed, exploiting EU funding, a solution called Track One that uh, enables the complete visibility of the supply chain. What does it mean for ours? Of, of course, we can track container, we can track track, we can track uh, uh, means, transport means, but our approach has an improved granularity, so it is good oriented. And uh, so it enables a uh, dedicated monitoring because if I'm going to monitor uh, the fruit it's different to go to monitor wine for example then we use an approach a standardized and interoperable approach since we uh, of course we participate uh, to to atlas but we are natively interoperable exploiting uh, gs1 apcis 2.0 standard that is uh, uh, a worldwide known standards by gs1 that is in the logistic domain. And then we have a secure and trustworthy access. So everyone get access to our platform will see the data that uh, he can see. So he, he will, he, uh, the data that belongs to him. So for example, I'm an owner of a truck, I'm tracking my truck. And this scenario opens uh, an important uh, um, uh, path toward the interoperability in the agri food domain. In fact, what we can do here is, of course, monitor the perishable goods, so fruits, wine along the supply chain. But uh, what we, are, we can do is also enable a double interoperability. So uh, in the two domains that are logistics and uh, agriculture, uh, exploiting, of course, the Atlas network. So I leave the speech to this video. If it's perishable, it's to be monitored. Today, keeping track of your shipment status is utmost importance if you want to meet your customer satisfaction. The solution unlocks a secure IoT environment, tracking and monitoring your goods throughout the whole supply chain. Our smart basket identifies goods and reusable assets, providing their time position and condition. Thanks to our cutting edge IoT solution, the main phases that your goods go through can be real time monitored, reduce shipment problems, enhance decision making and implement circular economy practices to order more secure and greener logistics. Track one, the IoT for logistics, solution by NGS based on proprietary technologies. So the challenging we are the challenges we are facing are essentially the lack of transparency and, and visibility of the supply chain. So there is no traceability, both in terms of logistics, but also in this case, we can also implement uh, a real tracking from uh, farm to fork uh, because uh, we are capable to identify goods and then you can track this uh, along the supply chain, track and monitor. Uh, then we enable, uh, 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 we, uh, then we cannot, uh, the logistics cannot be optimized, having, uh, uh, not having information about the position of the goods. And then uh, we are here, lack of dedicated, dedicated sensor that is uh, integrated in the logistic scenario. So we have tracker with the temperature, humidity sensor, but not other sensor. In fact, there are, are not no IoT connectivity, so it's not possible to adapt new sensors uh, and uh, implementing a vertical solution for perishable goods. Uh, and finally, uh, and going in the direction of physical internet, that is the challenge of EU uh, to reach uh, the um, optimization of the logist logistics, we uh, enable the interop an interoperable appro approach uh, both for logistics and agriculture. And in this scenario, we support the 
the reduction of climate change and and we uh, aim at reducing the waste uh, food waste reduction in fact the benefit of, benefits of our solution is of course to and dual interoperability uh, and a trusted visibility so we can support uh, logistics and agriculture but we can also share the data in a in a uh, trusted manner and uh, we uh, and moreover we have uh, a real time fact based Based decision making. In fact, we have an open scala biofish environment. We can add ethylene sensor, and this is very important for the fluid. Uh, we can enable the uh, generation of alert and to mitigate the problem. And then we can evaluate the food perishing so we can reduce the waste. I show you some, some pictures. This one is uh, our graphical user interface. Uh, this one are the real data collected from the Peter uh, uh, warehouse. So we, con we can control the ethylene. Uh, then then uh, maybe if someone don't know what is ethylene, I mean, I will answer your question. And finally, our solution will support customer satisfaction because uh, we have a detailed and trusted traceability. And this one is a requirement for the final user, essentially. And then uh, we can also, since we have this uh, secure analog access, uh, track um, the vehicles. Vehicles means, okay, logistic vehicles, as well as uh, fleet in the agriculture, so tractors and items, as well as uh, uh, um, uh, um, baskets that can be seen as a reusable item, so going through the green, green logistics and the, 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 the circular economy. So our approach supports cost reduction, efficiency improvement, green logistics, and a more secure supply chain. Uh, thanks a lot. These, these are my contacts and uh, waiting for your questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, Claudio, that was very, very insightful, uh, together with Peter and um, Stefan. So I think we are clearly proving why our participants should also join the Atlas Network and increase agricultural productivity in a sustainable way by exchanging the most advanced digital technology and services in this domain. So now let's wrap up and um, please continue sending your questions. I've seen some of them already going through. Um, so I will start reading them um, out loud as um, yeah I go reading them. Okay, I see one for Claudio. Why did you use ethylene sensors? Uh, because ethylene is a strange gas. It's a gas that is produced by fruit that is ripening, and it is a fruit that is a gas that enables the ripening. So if you don't control the ethylene, uh, you will destroy your goods because uh, uh, if the, the if your um, goods fruit start to produce uh, uh, ethylene, it means that they are ripening, and the, the production of ethylene increase the ripening. So the, the the fruit will get rotten, especially during the uh, cargo shipment, so in containers, where uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of, uh, um, a big amount of fruit transported. So this one is uh, the main reason. Then uh, there are a lot, a lot of literature on on uh, internet, but if you have two parts per million of uh, ethylene in the air, it means that uh, the fruit start to ripen very fast. All right, that was uh, very clear, I think. Uh, Peta, we have one question for you. What has been your biggest challenge in digitalization so far? Well, for us, it's um, the biggest challenge really is uh, is coming from from all the social aspects, but also from the cost. It's it's less the tools themselves. So when we wanted to start, um, we first had to invest more than 50,000 uh, Swiss francs into equipment to really be ready to, to go with tractors and implements. And uh, for smaller farms, 30 hectares, that's substantial investment. So that is one part. And then um, we call it kind of banana solutions. <laughs> meaning they ripe at the customer and not actually where they should be ripening so unfortunately also many solutions are not really market ready um, meaning you need to invest still a lot of time into them so these are these are very important uh, challenges that we have faced so far 
and then actually okay. interoperability. But this, I hope, is solved now with Atlas, which uh, looks to be to be actually the case. This is a good one. What does dual interoperability mean? So interoperability uh, is very important, uh, okay, in agriculture because uh, connects uh, different uh, uh, components in a with the, uh, maybe legacy system that enables the better comprehension. I mean, I'm an engineer, and it's, for me, is maybe it's easy to understand data. What <laughs> we want to do is to say, okay, there are instruments taught for agriculture workers, and they need to have a certain ergonomicity. What we do is much more, because uh, using a GS1 APCIS, uh, we are introducing a organizational interoperability. What does it mean? That my company has this coding approach. My company has this other coding approach. If I'm sending product A of company A to company B, there, there are no matching of uh, this data. But GS1, that is the company of uh, the barcodes that you can find every goods, has standardized a set of codes that enable the organizational interoperability. So it's not a matter of uh, digital communication. So we, 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 I mean, of course, they, they have a standardized approach on representing the data, collecting, and so on. But the most, the most important thing is that they are capable to map the data, the information, the codes in a standard manner. In this manner, you can speak with the several uh, legacy system and especially in the logistics. In the logistics, the physical internet will require the, the integration and harmonization of uh, the data from IoT. And uh, GS1 and PCIS is one of the best candidates on that. <laughs> the internet is the uh, European Commission uh, direction to implement uh, the, in the, the uh, digital internet paradigm on logistics. All right, thank you very much, Claudio. And let's then finish this with Peta. Uh, it's a bit related to this. Uh, where do you see the biggest opportunity in data interoperability? And then there is another one a bit linked. How do you think you are best or benefiting the Atlas interoperability network and vice versa? How is Atlas benefiting the four leaf farm? Well, what we see is we collect a lot of data on sustainability and that to me is also one of the core things that Atlas and data interoperability can provide. So what we do is we, we do collect this data. Uh, a problem we see there or a challenge is that this data currently is just recorded by farmers by hand in many cases. And this data this way is kind of unalterable. And, and let's say you're kind of reporting yourself the amount of fertilizer you have been applying I mean, the, when you're getting paid to reduce the volumes there, there's quite uh, some incentive uh, if your uh, kind of pen is not writing down exactly what you have applied. And we really believe that this data should be gathered from sensors, should be unalterable and uh, should even be hashed and going probably into blockchains. Uh, for the stuff that's really important. And also there needs to be the interoperability. And I think the, the best part that we can contribute to here is that we collect this data, that we look into this. And apart from that, what we really deliver in Atlas is to test and improve the decision support tools in the use cases we are in and delivering the data there so that they can be improved. Well done, perfectly. Perfectly said, because I think this is the way we should uh, conclude all the joint sessions to basically uh, convince and persuade all our uh, participants to, to join uh, to the Atlas Interoperability Network and register so that they can uh, discover by themselves. All right, thank you both of you. Thank you also for all your presentations and the answers. I think we thank can you. already move on to the final part of the agenda, and that is the panel discussion. All right, I will now turn on to the, moder the moderation role to our colleague and Atlas partner, uh, Karsten Gisseler and CEO of Fodjan. 
will be moderating the panel discussion to answer the question, can digital agriculture and food system lead the way to net zero? The panel is formed by experienced panelists working in agriculture and the food industry, will bring insightful contributions and opinions based on their different backgrounds, expertise, and understanding in sustainable agriculture and the food sector. As such, the panel discussion will bring together the following speakers. Alard Estelenik, Global Technical Manager at Dairy, um, Dairy at True Nutrition, Nikolaus Volgemuth, Carbon Markets Expert at Carbon Future, Marcella Bidoku, Researcher at the Institute of Sciences and Technologies for Sustainable Energy and Mobility of National Research Council of Italy, and Mariana Faraldi, Senior Researcher at Tecno Alimenti. But I think it will be best if I let them introduce by themselves. So enjoy the next half an hour and over to you, Carsten. Yeah. Thanks um, Insert for that introduction. Um, yeah, you already um, told the, the topic. So we today we discuss how can digital solutions help um, agriculture on their way to, to net zero. And um, maybe to start first with the beginning of the way of agriculture, that's 12,000 years ago. Um, and since then, we have three problems to solve. I think so that's um, that's hunger, um, still not solved today. So we have to push, hopefully, this um, the next 50 years to solve that um, worldwide um, and overcome hunger. I think that's uh, the biggest should be the biggest target in agriculture. Um, then we have health because um, you need not just food, something. Yeah, and you need healthy food. You need also vitamins. You need um, a variety of foods. It's not just having a bunch of wheat. Um, of course, you can survive with that, but how long? And um, in total, also having a good life on our planet is highly dependent on agriculture. So in the end, um, maybe some some people in cities don't mention that, but um, in the end, agriculture is um, highly connected to the whole um, you know, how you, you live on, on our planet. Um, for example, biodiversity. Yeah? Maybe not that old that we, we had that um, in mind um, as humans, but in the end, agriculture is a big basis on our whole culture. And so um, I would already say that we, on our way 12, from 12,000 years ago, um, agriculture is under constant pressure. Yeah? So, um, and under constant pressure to change because we, we have to change that problems every time new and have to, um, um, that shelves. And now, of course, it's uh, a new um, big problem occurs. Um, that's the, uh, yeah climate change, for example, and also um, net zero is not just um, climate, it's also um, nitrogen and phosphate. So we see that we um, become more and more sustainable with agriculture. And there is a lot of work to do as well. But um, let's say it's a lot of work, but I'm optimistic because I see that the last 12,000 years agriculture invented the dough many times new. And, um, and especially in the last 100 years, we had to make a huge progress. So I'm very curious to see the next 50 um, and I see also there we can do a lot yeah, in agriculture so it's an innovative industry. Um, yeah, First some words to me maybe um, to start the introduction. Um, I'm Carsten Giesler, CEO of um, Fodia. We are a digital um, platform for uh, livestock management started with feeding um, and have a lot of um, feed companies connected on our platform which work together with customers um, with their customers to have um, more sustainable feeding in the end, economically, and but also um, in direction of net zero already. So we do some steps there. Yeah, and um, so I'd like to pass over to the other attendees um, and give them the word. But I'd also like to push a question um, there as well. And yeah, how do you, um, in the moment, work on, on your current role? and? on the way to net zero or what do you see or expect in that direction in the next steps? So first, maybe a good, um, how are you connected to that? And I would like to start with Nicolas, please. Thank you very much, Carsten. So I work for Carbon Future and Carbon Future developed a tracking system for bulky goods like biochar which can achieve permanent carbon removal in combination with agriculture not only there but also um, as one of the pillars in agriculture um, so to achieve net zero we do need to take various actions and uh, to go into the area like into the fields um, and placing their um, carbon 
observing material is one of the one of the I would say most promising and most scalable activities. And here, Carbon Future is active with um, allowing to monitor um, and report where our carbon removals are stored. Thanks, Nicolas. And um, then next, please, Mariana. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so. Um, uh, personally, I'm a senior researcher since uh, 21 years uh, in, uh, in Technoalimenti, so in strict contact with farmers and uh, with uh, food producers. And uh, uh, really, sustainability is uh, uh, a challenging and uh, uh, hot point in this, uh, in this moment. Uh, from one side, because it is uh, something which is required by policymakers in some way, but also from the consumers. And in some way, farmers and food industry need uh, to adapt uh, to these requests, uh, which comes uh, in some way from, uh, also from the market. Thank you, Mariana. Um, next, Alan, please. Thank you, uh, Carsten. Um, my name is Alan Esselin. I'm Global Technical Manager here at Tron Nutrition, a global animal feed company. We produce uh, young animal feeds like milk replaces, premixes, minerals, uh, completes, feeds, and feed additives. Um, yeah, the most important step and for us, and I think for the agriculture, as we need to produce more food, uh, what you mentioned in the introduction also, uh, Karsten, um, is to improve farming process and farming efficiency. And we still have a, a long way to go there. And therefore, if we contribute to the bottom line of the farmer, right, that's number one, we can be very sustainable and have very good uh, ambitions, but in the end, uh, uh, someone, uh, at least for the farmer, there should also be uh, a good earning in that. Um, and so therefore, uh, we need to build for the dairy sector a resilient dairy cow that can produce a longer time uh, more milk. Uh, because what we also learn in different uh, life cycle assessments, what we do is that the cow who stays longer at the dairy farm producing more milk has the lowest output uh, emission per kilo of product produced. We do this in three ways uh, from our side. We improve early life nutrition, we call this a life start, and support our health uh, during the different stages of lactation. Here we look at the different uh, adaptations, eh? the metabolic, immune, and the digestive adaptations. We call this the healthy life uh, part. And by precision nutrition, and I think that's where our paths cross, uh, Karsten, uh, by meaning that every stage, in every stage of lactation, her lifetime, uh, we supply the animal with the right amount of nutrients. Thanks, Alan. Um, Marcella, please. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, I am uh, a researcher from uh, the Institute of Science and Technologies uh, for Sustainable Energy and Mobility of the National Research Council of Italy. And uh, my research is particularly focused on solutions to reduce negative impacts on soil due to the use uh, of agricultural machines. Uh, so uh, in the Atlas project, particularly, we ran a pilot study in Torino that was addressed to test the use of autonomous vehicles, uh, namely agricultural robots. And uh, we tested the Polybot, that is a prototype designed and built by the Polytechnic di Bari and uh, the Institute of Intelligent Industrial Systems and Technologies for Advanced Manufacturing of the CNR, too. And, uh, in the pilot activities, we tested the robot's ability to move and operate autonomously on different field conditions, from freshly tilled soil to grass-covered soil, including sloppy condition, thanks to propositive sensors and also external optical sensors. And this is because the use of robots in agriculture can help in reaching a zero Zero, net zero in agriculture, since uh, it is aimed to optimize agricultural systems, producing more food with uh, less resources. So less land, less inputs, like uh, less water, less pesticides, less fertilizers, uh, and also supporting human labor, so reducing health risk and also adopting a more sustainable use of soil 
that is a very important resource in agricultural and also can contribute to uh, uh, reach net zero. Thank you, Marcella. So um, let's start into the discussion and I would like to start with an um, open question. So um, what are the biggest problems you see to reach net zero in agriculture? So that's, um, yeah. Albert already put it something in. The farmer has to earn money with it, otherwise he doesn't do it. No, I think I think when I, when you look at making a different uh, uh, life cycle assessments, uh, the first thing what what you see is there is hardly a reward at this moment eh, for a farmer uh, to do uh, to adapt his uh, way of farming. Um, so there's hardly a reward. So there should be a reward for, for doing this. And the second part, when I speak uh, on dairy, when you do an LCA, we are kind of the dairy sector is kind of punished for the emissions we do, they do, but not rewarded for the fixation of carbon. And maybe Nicolaus can, can uh, say something uh, to that in a later stage. Uh, but when I when I run an LCA, I don't see uh, the reward for having certain crops who can bind uh, a higher amount of carbon uh, in the plant or in the soil. And so that's to me a strange thing. In, in, if you don't fix that, uh, it will be difficult to get to uh, to a net zero. Yeah, very understandable for me also that farmers um, don't do things where they um, can't earn money with because oh, you you have to put your bit of time what you have as a farmer and to things which is good for society. Yes, but in the end you are in the end of the also you have also to feed your Kids, yeah, and also send them to some travels with their classmates or whatever. And um, it's hard to see when you say, okay, I do a lot for society, but I don't get things for that. So in the short term, it maybe will work out. But when you have a crisis as a company and you have to provide money to your um, employees, then it's um, then every every farmer has to decide for that things which are um, yeah would get money into the company. So in the end, that's um. That's the basic things. Otherwise, it's, it couldn't happen. Yeah. So that's I. And otherwise, what I think when it comes to that, um, you have to earn money with that. We have a good example in agriculture after Second World War. Um, we changed agriculture in that way that farmers earn a lot of money when they produce a lot of food. Now, yeah, because we had hunger afterwards in Germany, for example. Um, and what the, the problem was um, after ten years, the problem was the opposite. We have too much food. Yeah. So um, you see that agriculture can react very quick when you give the right boundaries, let's say that they, so it's not in that, they, that they're not innovative enough, in my opinion. So we have seen that in, in history, when they have the right model and, they, um, and it works out also economically for them, um, then they can push it really hard. So then they, um, when we would sell, um, pay farmers in a fair way for, for sustainability and for net zero, I think, um, then we have to think already about how to um, slow that down afterwards. Yeah? So that's, um, that's the history of the European agricultural policy that um, in the end farmers can react really well when you have the right boundaries. And then it's hard to slow that down again. Yeah? Um, and so for me, that's also optimistic to see for the, um, for, um, yeah, the net, way to net zero. Because when we have the right boundaries, then um, agriculture will do that job. I'm very convinced about that. So that's, um, and I think also with, um, with digital solutions together, because there's a lot of opportunities in, but um, it's not a lack of, of culture or of change management in agriculture. We have shown that several times that the industry can be very quick and innovative when it's, when the boundaries are right. Yeah? Otherwise it's just, um, like in every industry, when a car producers won't earn money with electric cars, they wouldn't sell some. So that um, makes no sense. But it's a good business, so they change it quite quick. So that's um, that's quite logic to me. But then come maybe directly to um, to Nicolaus and the, um, and the carbon market in agriculture. So um, can you maybe explain a bit about that? How is that growing in agriculture and how easy is it for carbon future to get in contact with agriculture and in, in that industry? Because um, carbon future is um, a relatively new company and the, the business model to, to get money for, for carbon removals is also quite new let's say that way. So how is your experience in innovation with agriculture and that and how big is the market? 
Yeah, thank you, Carsten. I, I fully support what you said before that uh, yeah, if the regulatory framework um, is, is uh, done properly and uh, supportive to agriculture and to measures which actually go towards uh, climate change mitigation or, or emission reduction, also net zero, um, then the farmers will react quickly. So this is a this is a political political things and uh, and there also the carbon markets come in so carbon carb markets in a way are necessary always where uh, regulatory frameworks are not um, there yet because what we are doing is we issue um, carbon credits for activities uh, of the farmer which are kind of additional to his business and usual as usual and are, are additional to um, what he gets subsidized anyways in terms of activities. So um, for our markets today, um, we as Carbon Future, we are active uh, with permanent removals, as I said, with biochar and aligned activities. From my past career, I also, of course, know about uh, activities uh, like uh, increasing soil organic carbon stocks or um, reducing emissions from, from dairy industry. And I see the biggest challenge here um, is about the monitoring. And uh, if you want to issue a, a carbon credit, be it now for removal or for climate change mitigation, um, the monitoring is uh, is yeah, creating a kind of a huge effort for, for the farmer. And uh, the incentive then through the carbon credit may be comparably low um, to the additional effort he has to take for the measure itself, but also for the reporting. So this is this is hampering, and the question is, what is the right solution for um, to, to get actually, yeah, to achieve measures uh, in agriculture at scale? Is it the system of carbon crediting, or are there other measures like regulatory, like regulatory frameworks um, in a better position? Um, for us, uh, we, we focus on the on the permanent removals, like placing biochar, and we have here um, quite a good access to the agriculture. But only to the farmers, of course, who are kind of uh, first movers and who already work with that topic or, or are interested into that. Um, the majority of the farmers um, are, I would say, rather conservative, and they would need to be addressed um, by different frameworks. And how on the how big is that market at the moment? Can you say something about it? So maybe also. Um divided in removals and um, or maybe also first explain a bit the difference between removal certificates and reduction and then how big are that markets in the moment maybe in the European agriculture roughly so just that there is some research or... um, so maybe to take the first question to, to, to distinguish between removal and, and emissions avoidance this is this is fairly easily explained emissions avoidance is everywhere where you where you avoid um, co2 or other greenhouse gases like methane or, or nitrous oxide going into the atmosphere so the formation of these compounds is is avoided or reduced uh, an example measure would be um, for instance to um, to cover the, uh, the, the, the manure um, storage and to, to collect, for instance, the methane, methane or to, to put biogas plant uh, which, which converts the, the manure into, into usable gas. This is emission mitigation. At removals, uh, you look into increasing carbon stocks. Um, and there are two types of removals, the ones which are permanent, meaning with a, with a permanence uh, for a very long time, like over 100 years. Um, this could be, for instance, uh, yeah, using biochar as a soil amendment, but there are also shorter term removals, like, for instance, activities uh, which increase soil organic carbon stocks due to a uh, change of agricultural practices. Um, there, the removal is in a way uh, not permanent because if you change back the agricultural practice, the, yeah, the, the, the increased carbon stock may reduce, be reduced again and CO2 getting to the atmosphere. Um, in terms of market, I cannot tell you so much about um, about the market for emission mitigation certificates. Like overall, from the from the mitigation part, just that I know that there are several methodologies now out there. For instance, uh, the verified carbon standard jointly with Indigo has published a framework in, under which you could do various activities to to reduce emissions. Um, but I'm not so much aware how many of these activities have already been. Um, been Im implemented or how many projects are out there. On the removal part, I can tell you a little bit about our um, our ecosystem. So in the removals, uh, there is Carbon Future and there are other players. And um, I would say that in the in the last year, um, meaning 2021, we had 
yeah, placed removals uh, in the order of magnitude of maybe 25,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. This year it will be like uh, around um, 50 to 70,000 tons of CO2 equivalent and we look forward to increasing that um, to uh, the megaton scale 2024. So there is a lot of activity coming up um, but in um, in comparison to the overall emissions of agriculture, this is very minor. I would say this is in the in the one-digit percentage range. So. Okay, thanks for for that. But it sounds also like a good growing market. Um, also nice for climate that we see that already even when the, the boundaries and the requirements and the, the framework from governments is not that far, but we see that it's already growing and industry is. Um, really pushing that and I'm optimistic also out of that when politics also find the right frameworks that industry will even um, accelerate it even more yeah? so that we yeah. can really see a hockey stick maybe there and it's also highly needed yeah? so this um, I think the 1.5 um, decrease increase target um, is really under pressure already um, so we, we have to be quick yeah, but how can um, interoperability and cooperation help to um, reach net zero? Do you have some, all of you, um, some good examples for that or um, thoughts about that or wishes where some cooperation partners are needed or yeah, how do you do that? I can say something, for example, um, just a few words. I think that uh, uh, speaking about interoperability, I think we are speaking also about digitalization. So, uh, according to the experience uh, we are um, developing in uh, different uh, funded projects uh, uh, from the European Commission, I, in our mind, and there are a lot of studies behind this, digitalization is a way, in some way, to support uh, uh, this uh, transition towards uh, uh, sustainability, and uh, so uh, in, a, in our in our experience, uh, um, absolutely speaking about interoperability means uh, to sustain this digital transition, which uh, uh, goes in parallel with with this green transition in uh, in our in our mind. So. Uh, not under the technical uh, point of view, but uh, speaking about uh, a more high level, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, supporting farmers also in, dig in this digital transition means to support them in this, in this, uh, uh, in this sustainable uh, uh, travel in some way. So this is from, uh, from my point of view. Uh, can I also add something about uh, the, the role of uh, uh, robotic technologies uh, and uh, all that uh, is uh, connected also of, uh, with a uh, better soil management uh, and uh, because robot technologies can represent one relevant component in agricultural interoperability because uh, it is uh, strictly based on uh, the data acquisition and uh, um, and transmissions, uh, but and uh, then contrib can contribute also in reaching net zero uh, agriculture because uh, this uh, provide uh, the season support to farmers, uh, uh, also by optimizing the exploration of soil and crop status uh, and the needs and those uh, uh, applying uh, a precise fertilization with very high spatial re resolution and also using a low mass uh, machinery. So uh, this can be useful in the adoption of regenerative agricultural system that are uh, uh, aimed to a restoration uh, of uh, of soils, uh, for example, through uh, carbon, uh, sequestration, carbon sequestration, also the adoption of uh, practices like no-till farming or controlled uh, traffic farming, farming, so that can reduce uh, uh, GAG 
emissions uh, by means of soil compaction reduction and also by, by means of electrification because uh, uh, robotic platforms uh, can represent a new paradigm for agricultural agriculture equipment with uh, fleets uh, of lightweight machines uh, with uh, minimal compaction effort and also with a reduction of fuel consumption using instead uh, renewable energy. So this is a challenging and also a small contribution, but can be offered options uh, through also a high level of interoperability to contribute to reach net zero uh, using a, a new approach in agricultural machinery. Yeah, so I'm um, every time quite impressed um, about the possibilities which are enabled by that machinery. So because in the end, it's it's not rocket science anymore to form every square meter of your um, field individually yeah, so that you treat that individually you have that the technology is there somehow yeah so that's um it's possible or square meter maybe not maybe 10 square meters together but it's not that you have to to work on one field with one system and the horse is pulling them forever and you don't know what happens under you um, so we know a lot but I think that's just a huge enabler, that technology in the moment. And we are still waiting for interoperability that we say, okay, hmm, we come with manure to that field. So first we have to know how much nitrogen has to be in that, is in that manure in the moment. And then you need a near sensor in your um, machine there, which has to be connected somehow to your soil data, or you have some laboratory results they have also connected to your systems. Then you came up and like to have um, carbon removal certificates, then you need a lot of data what you're doing there because maybe even biochar is even now in your manure and then it's the question is it good to put the same amount of manure on every square meter or is it even better to put it on special um, places in your field because there it's more work for um, for production, there, there you have water leakage and when you put biochar there you solve that problem partly. So that's um, so there's a lot of things where I see that, that individual treatments of, of um, square meters, also of animals, enables a lot and detect the robotics, yeah, enable a lot to do that. But the other side is the interoperability that we can really make the nice decisions and um, and really farm individually um, in the yeah, our environment. And that will also solve a lot of biodiversity problems in future, I think. But it's still um, interoperability is is far behind um, automation. So we see that automation, but that is a maybe a, a good hobby of farmers also. Yeah, it's robotics, machinery. That's that's great. Um, and interoperability, that's the nasty stuff like bureaucracy. Yeah, well, I'm not seeing something, and so that's leaking behind. But when that comes together, that's really powerful. So I, my feeling is that we have maximum 20% of potential now at the ground yeah, of that technology. So that um, can really push that forward in future. And I'm curious to see that. Um, but how could, out of your views, all on the, um, the government maybe push that? We had that also in the beginning. We need some regularity um, frameworks around that um, farms. But um, do you have some specific ideas around that or, or wishes or even some thoughts just? Because it's not easy. Otherwise, I hope that the government has done it already. But it's... Uh, um, personally, I think that, um, as, as I already said before, so uh, when uh, uh, we speak about automation, robotics, uh, and the digitalization, uh, uh, in our experience, this is the future for uh, for agriculture in some, in some way and uh, for uh, for the farmers. And uh, as said uh, before, so in our mind, uh, uh, these uh, are some ways uh, to support farmers in this green transition and in uh, uh, this uh, net zero challenge. But uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, in some way, uh, digitalization in agriculture uh, implies some gaps and uh, uh, challenges. So for example, the lack of awareness in some way and skills uh, from the from the farmers, uh, the lack of trust, for example, in uh, um, 
uh, in, in new technologies, uh, in, uh, in data in some cases, and also the problem of investment. Farmers need to be in some way supported uh, from outside uh, in this investment in uh, new technologies, in digital tools, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, in uh, our experience, uh, uh, the solution is in some way in services. So for us, this is a key word, very, very important. So providing services to farmers, uh, this can be a way for overcoming uh, all the current gaps. And uh, um, in any case, we need the funds uh, uh, which uh, support uh, not only the investment on the machine per se, I mean, it is not necessary only an investment on purchasing the machinery, but uh, it is fundamental also that uh, the policy makers, that the decision may, uh, making, that the governments support also something more. I mean, the accompaniment uh, uh, behind it. So when we speak about this, we speak about technology providers who support strongly the farmers, DIH, so digital innovation apps, and also, uh, I would uh, add uh, the platform similar to Atlas platform, because uh, this is a platform uh, very useful, very service oriented, which can be useful for, for farmers uh, uh, in this way. So where policymakers in some way understand this as a primary necessity, we are convinced that a big step forward can be made. And this is what also emerged uh, from Smart agri uh, Synergy Days uh, last uh, October 27 in Lisbon, uh, to the presence of 350 uh, researchers uh, representing 23 funded uh, projects in the agri-food sector in an uh, action line which was uh, called the policy recommendations. It was something led by us, by Technolimenti, under the head of uh, OpenDI, which is a CSA, and to which Atlas also uh, actively contributed. So this is our, uh, this is not uh, my personal uh, idea, but this is something which uh, comes from uh, uh, a common view from different researchers in the, in the field. I also like that service model approach because otherwise I don't see that farmers can finance all and take all that risk also. Yeah? And the industry is producing that solutions, they know the machines best and then um, they can also say what will be damaged and how much it really costs in the life cycle and not um, just, oh, we have a good machine and afterwards you have to pay a lot for maintenance. So that's, um, I think, also a good share of risks because um, them and could be also very attractive business models for farmers and then, um, to have that. So when we look on our time, so I would like to have a closing um, round, short one, um, with the short question to everyone, um, how long will it take to have net zero in agriculture in Europe? Yeah? So that's, um, that's maybe, that's, yeah, that's a stable, stable political ground in the moment, hopefully. Um, but how long will that, um, Will that take, in in your opinion, just maybe a year? And um, what you say, I can start. Maybe I would say 2045. Not you, really optimistic, but um. Uh. I think it is fundamental the policy environment. I mean, uh, uh, in absence of a strong policy environment and support, uh, the uh, the way can be longer. But. Uh, if uh, policymakers are aware about uh, the needs, uh, the requirements, and can strongly support these, I think that uh, the, uh, it can require less time uh, uh, to have this net zero agriculture in Europe. Yeah, I would agree yeah. to that. And take, sorry, uh, that it can take lesser time, maybe even just five to ten years. Um, if the environment, policy environment and regulatory framework are set in a way which really helps farmers to, to work on that. But the, the cycles uh, on a farm are quite, quite short compared to other industries. Um, so I think it can be achieved quicker. Yeah, I think also, let's say, if everything is in place and a clear set of regulations and a clear, also from politics, uh, would expect a clear path forward. Uh, that they not, don't change their policy in two or three years from now because we have seen that in, in uh, happening too much. Uh, so then people are hesitant to invest. Uh, but um, I'm optimistic by nature. So technically, I think also between 10 or 15 years we could uh, do this. 
Yeah, and uh, finally, I, I, I'm confident with the new generation of farmers uh, that uh, I think uh, they are increasing uh, its uh, their awareness uh, about the uh, relevance of a really sustainable agriculture of uh, the uh, relevance of uh, have a, a soil that is, is healthy to provide a healthy soil and also uh, healthy food uh, and also with their uh, uh, better uh, um, confidence with new technologies uh, but there there is a needing of uh, support by policies uh, and uh, for example the european policies about the soil uh, or and also research uh, for technologies uh, advances uh, not only on uh, agri robotics but uh, also about uh, a better harmonization of uh, uh, soil monitoring or uh, Crop monitoring. So I think that uh, with uh, a really um, harmonized work, uh, the the new generation can uh, uh, help uh, uh, to reach the net zero in agriculture. Okay, so that's um, maybe more optimistic now as well. I would decrease my assumption. But um, first of all, um, thanks to all of you for that good discussion. I think we had some. Um, good topics and um, yeah, hope the best that we can reach it in five years or so. Um, I will do my best as well to push it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Bye. Great. Thank you very much for the perfect timing and for this optimistic discussion. I think it, it sounds very ambitious. And that was, I think, also very uh, comprehensive uh, to hear out the different uh, experiences that you all had uh, on this subject. Um, but it seems from today's discussion that uh, keywords like agriculture, food systems, automation, uh, interoperability, digitalization, policies, and sustainable farming practices are in a very good position to lead the way to the net zero, uh, to achieve the net zero um, targets. And of course, we cannot do this on our own. We need the support and cooperation of many relevant actors and uh, also other sectors, as we indicated in the discussion. Um, but it seems that Atlas is in a very, very good position uh, to, to basically cover all these um, subjects uh, in one single network. And this is why we created uh, this tool for everyone, for the farmers, software developers, and every target audience that we've been mentioning. Now, if you would like to address any question, any comment, or uh, anything that you would like to highlight, please do not hesitate again to use the chat. This is what we are here for, and we'll try to return to you as soon as possible. Now, before we fin finalize with the last Atlas Demo Day, um, I would like to thank you all, especially to our uh, speakers, Innovation Hubs and Open Call winners, uh, for their fantastic job, um, Yeah, basically presenting all the use cases uh, and the, the Atlas use cases that will be uh, there for you. So many thanks. Um, also to Karsten and our four panelists who did a fantastic job as well uh, in the panel discussion and certainly to our ETSEDO team behind the cameras uh, for their priceless support uh, throughout the event. Lastly, a big shout out to all of you behind the cameras in the, in the audience for sticking to the event until the very end. Uh, we also wanted to take this time to thank you all for being there. Um, we will follow up with you um, via email to obtain your feedback on the on the event through a survey that we have prepared. Hopefully, you can already see it in the chat. Um, we'll also keep in touch, and um, please don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list and also, of course, uh, join us to the Atlas Network as a participant um, because this is also the the key message that we wanted to transmit today uh, at the event. All right, I won't be taking much more of your time. Uh, as I said, we look forward to seeing you all at the, in the network, in the Atlas network. And I will leave you now. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. And again, thank you all. Bye. <laughs>